Garstucci. I'm the co-chair. We have a deal the agenda tonight. And any, this is our first uh, Zoom meeting as a Housing, Health, and Human Services Committee. Um, we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves, and then I'll come back and talk about um, how we're going to conduct the meeting tonight. Maria? Well, actually, I'll talk about how we conduct the meeting tonight, but I'm Maria Ortiz. Go right ahead. Chair. Right. Um, I'll do it after everyone introduces themselves. So, Maria Ortiz, the co-chair. Just take Martin. it out. Dolores Rubin. Hey, yeah. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, I'm Leslie Kristen Williams. Tate. Hey, Jill Dayhill. Paul Ames. Betty McIntosh, committee member. Did everyone introduce themselves? Please. James, Wallace. James. James Wallace, committee member. It's committee member. Right. And Michael Noble, right? Right. And I'm Lowell Kern. I'm the chair of CB4, but I'm, I'm just ex officio on the committee. And we have Nellie Gonzalez as our staff member. Go ahead, Maria. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Nellie. She's doing all our tech for tonight. Um, and per the governor's executive order, we're running this board meeting remotely. Um, it's going to be trans. It's going to be recorded and transcribed. It's also going to be on YouTube. Um, so how we're going to do the run of show is that basically everyone is going to stay muted throughout the meeting, except for whoever is speaking. After um, uh, the presenter is done speaking. First, the committee members are going to speak and ask their questions. Then members of the public will next ask their questions, raise their concerns. Um, and in order to speak, you need to press the raise hand button on your screen. If you are an attendee, it should be on the bottom of your screen in the middle. Um, and if you're calling in, in order to speak, I'm sorry, if you're calling in, in order to raise your hand, you're gonna have to press star nine, okay? Um, and then, so it's gonna be the first the committee members, then the public, and after the public comment, the committee is gonna be begin their discussion and then we'll conclude with a decision. Sometimes we vote on something. We don't always vote on every item that we discuss. <clears throat> um, if there are any questions related to the Zoom functions or our can you please raise your hand now? I see one person raising their hand, and that's Jennifer. All right, Maria, I'm going to jump in for one second. I just want to ask because before you get to that, um, Joe, do you want, do you, Joe and Maria, do you want the um, elected officials move back to the panel now? Not until we not until we start talking. I think this is more okay. like okay. Yeah. Um, because I was I'm getting texts about that, and there's a question from um, the project renewal team. I've gotten an email and in the Q and A. Um, Maria, can you just address how you'll move them over? Um, let me just see the question. Hi, this is Melissa. Yes, we will be able to move anyone over to panelists. And Nellie, correct me if I'm wrong. We'll be able to move anyone over to panelists to speak and answer questions. Yes, that is yeah. correct. So, and just a note for the committee members, because we can see you, just raise your hand like that. That'll move us along faster. And then it's like a regular committee meeting, remember, as bizarre as this is, that in fact, people will raise their hands. We deal with the issue. We talk about it among the committee first, and then we take questions or ask questions from the public. That's at the end. Okay. Um, it looks like, and so I had just asked everyone, uh, all the attendees, if they have a question re related to the Zoom functions, and I see a hand raised. It looks like Craig, but if it's not really, okay, thank you. And we're just joined by Hector Vasquez also. Hector, welcome. Thank you for joining. I know you've had a rough day. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you guys. And lady. Cool. Okay, so um, can we move on to the first item on the agenda? Yes. Um, it is about 51st Street, and it is about Lantern. I say it with a big smile, but it's 
it's been very challenging for me lately regarding 51st Street. So first, Lantern, this is, um, they came before us a couple of months ago. Um, and this is the letter we had drafted. We weren't able to vote on it sooner. I cannot recall exactly the reason why. I do remember, um, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, when Lantern was last there, our meeting went so late, I think we forgot to actually vote on the letter. We, we, ha we had a letter that was done in bullets only, and this was the flesh out of the letter that became the full thing, and then March hit, and we lost the track of it. <coughs> Excuse me. So the letter, I'm just going to give a highlight about the letter. Um, basically, Lantern is a social services agency. They have, and Joe, you can, you're welcome to jump in and correct me with anything. Um, they are located on 51st Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. Uh, Lantern acquired that site as part of an SRO preservation commitment um, uh, from 2009, but they acquired the site in 2011. Um, I know that Community Board 4 at that time, I wasn't on the Community Board, but the Community Board was meeting right, um, Lantern had come before committee a couple of times, and I know that a cab, there was a cab that started, I don't know exactly when it started and ended, Joe, but I know that there was a cab that met regularly, and I know that there was a lot of input from CB4 in terms of the proposed designs, which included also a reduction in the number of units to have more quality units. Um, and, and at that time, the commitment was that it was going to be 60% of the units would be for community tenants, and 40% of the units would be for formerly homeless tenants. Um, All the way around. I'm sorry? All the way around. 60% homeless, 40% community. 60% homeless, you said? 60% homeless, 40% community, but however, the building was majority occupied, so that would be achieved over time as people moved or, or passed away. Okay, I gotta fix that in the letter, thank you. And then, um, and Lantern came before us in um, October of 2019, came before committee and in January. Um, in October, they came because they were asking for more funding related to um, having a security on, uh, the, ex on the exterior for a couple, an, an additional number of days of the week. Um, what was interesting about that is that uh, tenants and residents who attended the meeting didn't agree with us um, approving that funding, um, even though they had quality of life concerns about that establishment and I think that that demonstrated there were other ongoing concerns at Lantern um, and so because of that CAB uh, a community advisory board meeting for Lantern began again in December right and the issues that the issues that have come up particularly in October and in January when Lantern came before us have been the, the ongoing quality of life and safety issues on the block uh, the lack of clarity related to overnight guests, the atmosphere created with guards in uniform on site, and ADA compliance in the bathroom. Uh, and hmm. when they came in January, something else that like that is um, worth noting, and it's in the letter. I hope everyone read it, and I'm doing this because perhaps you didn't get to read the letter, and this is also for the public. In January. Uh, when committee, uh, when Lantern came before committee, one of the things that came up is that the community room and the social services office, social services offices were finally completed. However, that was part of the original plan that was approved back in uh, 2012 or 2013. Yes. Um, so that was kind of uh, not good. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to mention was as a result of the CAB meeting that we've had. So we started in January through May. We've had about five CAB meetings. Um, some of the things that have come up has been that the, mo that the most disruptive tenants at Lantern were taking different, Lantern is taking different avenues to whether it's to taking the cl these clients to court or to um, alternative placement so that they're better served. The crux of the letter basically is that we support the move, we support that, and that we as a community welcome affordable, supportive housing, but uh, that HRA needs to understand the limitations of the site. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do was amend line 76, 
is that I think HRA also needs to do a more thorough assessment of potential clients. Uh, this letter also adds that perhaps another social services partner would be better suited. And Joe, I guess you can add anything because you know more history about. Yeah, our, our major issue is that when the project was brought to the community board and approved, it was not, it was an SRO preservation project that came out of the Western Rail Yards affordable housing commitments. We were not expecting to see such a social service needy population at this location. We knew there would be, there would be some social service needy population, but not the depth and the need. That depth and need has created a major problem for the residents on the block and in the building, especially with a handful of tenants. The board has worked very diligently with Lantern, with, with the cab, to try to resolve it. It is not resolved by any stretch of the imagination. This letter was passed back in February. We're really just clarifying it and memorializing it because we were so overloaded at our February meeting. So I really want to, at this point, just go and physically, remember, raise your hand from the committee members if you have any questions or comments about the letter. Yes, Leslie. Yes, um, the first thing I, I want to say, we in the community, because I happen to live on 51st Street, so I'm very versed, very ver versed on the community, on the block. I've lived here for 44 years. So I've gone through the times, and I know I'm 39. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know you guys are surprised, yes. But on, uh, when I moved here in 1976, it was the heyday of 42nd Street. Leslie, I got to ask you, though, about the letter. Can you talk about the letter? Yes, I'm getting to that because this reflects on that letter. In right. 76, this neighborhood was a disaster. <laughs> we are now back at that level. Joe, we are back at 1976. Right, but I'm letter, asking you on, on this matter, can you the first comment, the first, letter, though? yes, the first sentence in this thing does not reflect what we would want as a community board. It says, would like to acknowledge the continuing commitment to work with Lantern Community Service regarding Stardom Hall. Then you read the rest of it, and it talks about the deficiencies with Lantern. I don't see the two going together. They, there's no relationship between that first sentence and the rest of it. Well, they do not support the community. Okay, we're not we're not supporting the community. We're not. We're not we're no, not no, supporting. they are not supporting the community. I'm not saying right. the board is not. I'm right. saying right. that they are not supporting the community. When I asked that question at one of the uh, subcommittee meetings, and I said to them, "But well, what is your charge?" She talked about what their charge as an organization is. But I said, do you have a responsibility to the community? And they said, no, we really don't. We talk to them once in a while. They're not addressing the community needs. I, I think we've had many meetings with Lanterns at, Lantern at our committee. In fact, where they really focus on mission as opposed to the issues raised in the community. It's been very frustrating for all of us. And we are in total agreement that Lantern has not been the most responsive or well-managed organization. I said that in public, I said that privately. However, this letter says we acknowledge our commitment to work with Lantern regarding this location. It's not a commitment to Lantern. I say they should be removed. I say they should be removed from the community. We need okay. a competent group to manage this uh, facility. Lantern right. is not that. They are so, not competent. I think, I think you have a pretty broad point of view that a lot of people will agree with. But this letter, just want to note again for everybody in the committee, this was reviewed in bullet form and agreed to and voted on at our February meeting. This is merely the fleshing out of that letter. So I don't want to create an impression that we're bringing this for the first time. Note the date, February 3rd. So that's why I'm asking everyone to focus on the content of the letter because the content of the letter, it's board. germane. What is germane, Joe, is that first two sentences, they are inaccurate and they need so to be changed. Why would, we not, why would we not want to have a commitment to work with them regarding we this want location? another organization. Move well, that, Lantern that, to another uh, facility elsewhere. Let them manage it in another community, but not our community. Okay, so, you're, so your thought on a letter that we've passed already. That's the problem, Leslie, procedurally. Well, is that procedurally, been if you make a mistake, board? procedurally, if you make a mistake, you correct it. You it's do not, not going, continue. Okay, so let's go to the next person. We'll come back to it. You'd like to say, don't work with Lantern. Next committee Correct. member, raise your hand, please. Betty. You 
You're muted, Betty. Can't hear you. I, I gave you some small edits, no problem with that. I, I thought that the letter was, could, should be clarified about that a community room has now been completed and is, is available according to what I gathered from this uh, document and that, and that I think that the question I ask would be, uh, has that community room been used? Has it uh, been, if it's yes, what social service programs? Because the letter says there should be social service programs and has that happened before the corona uh, virus hit and if it hasn't happened then why not uh, is it, they have lack of uh, staff do they have inappropriate staff in other words seems to me you should be more specific about that okay well if you have some notes we'll take them so let, let's go around the room speaking to the lantern letter Sarah yeah I just had a quick question Maria you mentioned uh, a clarification on line 77, 76, about the HRA, how there would be a potential recommendation for a review. Was that correct? Yeah. I think that, I, I am in favor of that change and I think that would potentially help um, some of what I'm hearing from Leslie as, you know, potentially seeing some other options. Um, but I thought it was a, a good letter overall. We should also note that the HRA are only some of the tenants. Maria, you'll have to, have to find that out. It's only a small cohort of the whole group that are HRA referred. Thank you. You mean, so they have 33 tenants that are, that are in the supportive housing piece. You're saying that it's only a smaller portion? Yes. Are HRA it's, referred? It's, it's a subset that are the specific type of HRA referrals that create a problem. Oh, okay, because so, I thought so, it was all 33. We, we we should get that information from them to clarify. Clarify that, okay. Paul. Paul, you're on mute. Paul. Start from the beginning, please. Here, we can't hear you. There it is. There, yes. There you go. Uh, this. It seems like we've been spending an awful lot of time on this particular outfit. Um, you think? I, I, I lean towards uh, favoring the pulling of a parachute uh, cord that I know doesn't exist and moving on, but it's a, such an intractable problem. Uh, I, never got, I never got the, the, the feeling that these folks were in charge of their, of, of their building, of their mission or anything else. I hate to say it about anybody, this is horrible, hard work to, for anyone to do. And, you know, the, your point, Joe, about which that subsection that's causing all the problem. Geez, there, it's it's all be tricky to find our way to thread this needle. It seems to me. I'm, I'm just say, stating the obvious. I have no great suggestions here. I don't know. I don't remember us ever saying we're going to just have to cut bait on these folks. You're not competent. You can't do the job. That's we have. We well, have it slipped my mind because we so often don't. That we give folks so much time. We work with them. That's what we do in this neighborhood. And I'm, I'm all for it. But this one was uh, hearing those folks who live on the block to give us chapter and verse was just yeah, wasn't sit through. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't have much to add to it. I, it's just an intractable, horrible mess of a problem. I wish it wasn't ours to have to fix, but I guess we do. Sorry, Judith. Hi guys. So I kind of agree with what uh, Paul just said, what Leslie said, that this letter doesn't reflect as strongly as we've heard so many people talk. And I wish that would somehow come across the, all the struggles that we've listened to and all the struggles that has been on the block. I don't know how to solve it. And I don't know if we can move them in light of this situation, but I just think it needs to be a little bit stronger evidence of what actually is happening on the block with that land of people. I think what's important to remember in this case, Lantern both owns and operates this building. And that's one of the issues we have. It's not like they're leasing it or there's some SRA, HRA thing happening here. They own, and, they own and operate it. So I think we're getting to a point where Leslie wants to be, but maybe not at this moment, because we're gonna work with them until they can't solve it. 
And but but the letter was a little bit clearer in stating strongly how the tenants are feeling and the passions of the people that we've listened to over the months. Okay. I think that would be better for the feeling of the letter. She means okay. the language e? for their concern. Okay. Now, this is, e? this is also part of Corey One minute, Johnson's Leslie, uh, Leslie, I'm going around the room. Leslie, Pete, okay. next. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I do recall uh, way back in, during those meetings that we had asked for a few other things as well. And one of them was for um, Wi-Fi uh, for the tenants in the building. I, I don't see that in the letter at all. And um, that social room uh, should have been available to, uh, a long time ago. Uh, Maria mentioned that uh, in the bathrooms that it should have been ADA compliance. That is the doorway. Uh, no, but that, some, uh, some are, Pete, some are compliant, not all of them. We're asking for more compliance at this point. I, they gave us I some. I, yeah, only one, if I recall, and that was the one at the lobby. In the, in no, the, um, there, first there's, one, there's one ADA per floor. We're asking for additional ones per floor. Right, and the, and the showers and the uh, bathrooms, that is the toilets, are separate. And uh, when I took a, a survey on my own, um, I believe that none of the bathrooms and showers were IADA compliance, for the exception of the one that was next to the social uh, uh, workers' office. Uh, the, so the, just the plans yeah. the board approved back in 2012 had one ADA compliant bathroom per floor, and we verified that with an architect before 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 we approved it. The okay, problem so is, it's only one per floor, uh, and someone came to us who had an illness and had to go from this side to that side, making it very difficult for them to do it. Remember? Yeah. Remember right. The, but I, I, the last time I took a look at that was a few months ago, uh, before one of the community board meetings. And I didn't, I actually took the measurements and none of the bathrooms or the showers were ADA compliance. They didn't meet the 34 uh, inches uh, requirement. Okay, so why don't we look so at the that plans my... that we approve versus what's been built? Yes, absolutely. Mm. Uh, Jessica? Um, thank you. I, I actually agree. I think if this letter was, sorry, I agree with some of the earlier comments. I think if, if you found this letter sort of, you know, in the archives of history, you'd say like, oh, there were some problems, like they're gonna work on it. And it, it, it doesn't feel like it really meets the moment in terms of the number, the extensive nature of the conversations that have had have been had. Um, and so I agree. I think the I I also agree though, Joe, that these are permanent um, operators that we need to be friends with. And so I think there, I think someone used the phrase threading the needle. I think there's a way to do that, but that it could be a little bit heavier in the um, statement of concerns. In normal circumstances, I would be delighted to offer to help um, make those edits at this moment. I, I'm afraid I don't think I have any more bandwidth to do that um, because of work commitments, but um, but I, you know, I'd be happy to edit a letter or contribute if I if if I can be helpful in that way. Thank you very much. Hector. Um I mean, basically, Lantern has been, I mean, we've been to a couple of <laughs> committee meetings with them on uh, several of these issues. And honestly, I, I don't believe there's been any real progress in the arena of making improvements when it comes to security. I mean, I know there was discussion of security guards and everything else being implemented and uh, in number and possibly making more rounds, that sort of thing. And there was other issues brought up by the community concerning um, that facility. And uh, honestly, this letter, I think I, I echo the sentiments of Paul and, and Judith and some of the other folks that um, it doesn't seem to really recommend any, I don't know, basically pushing Lantern to make these improvements a little bit more pliable and more uh, make real improvements to their center as far as uh, security and making the neighborhood and the community more comfortable with them being there at that location. I mean, uh, I mean, case in point, I have several, we have in my neighborhood, we have several locations where uh, Holy Apostle and other uh, homeless shelters and facilities and uh, 
we have issues with them as well. So I, I can kind of understand what the neighborhood's going through and the, um, and basically I think we need to, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would wish the, the letter was a little bit more centered stronger. and more force, stronger and forceful and okay. the aspect that, hey, these are the issues you're encountering. You need to see some solid plans moving ahead of what you're gonna to do to remedy this. Not just, hey, you know, we see you trying, you know, that's nice. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's forceful enough. I don't think it's gonna force the hand of Lantern to actually make any real improvements that'll make the community safer and more comfortable for them to be uh, a real part of the community. So that's how I feel about the letter. Okay, can I just, um, okay. um, Hector, thank you. And I just want to add something because that reminds me of something I should have shared um, that happened part of the, uh, during the CAB meeting. So this month, yeah, it was this month, um, a Lantern shared the, what they're doing differently related to the security. They're gonna, they have a vendor who's providing security. They're gonna be phasing that out currently and, and they're gonna be having um, what they call a resident coordinator. Um, who's I, I don't want to say providing security, but I guess like it, like Joe, like at your building, you have like a front desk person, you don't have security. Um, so they're going to have a resident. We have front desk people that have relationships with people in the building, so we know what's going on. Yeah, and I think that's really effective. I think it, the sense that I got is that they're trying to move towards that. Um, and what they currently they have someone from 4 p.m. to 12 a.m and someone 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. who's a Lantern staff person who's with security. Um, and that's Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, and they have that resident coordinator. They're hired by Lantern. So they work with Lantern. They get better training, like for example, the escalation techniques. Um, I, uh, so I just wanted to share that piece because I did not share it earlier. James? Hi. Um, first, I'm, I vaguely remember a meeting where this was discussed. Uh, I recently was on 51st Street and uh, there was a person kind of ranting and raving from across the street. So these problems continue. Uh, we know this person very well. He's been the subject of like 17 meetings, trust me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that being said, I mean, I recognize the need to have a lot of the history. I think that's a great part of the letter. It really sort of lays the groundwork. Um, before I comment, I wanted to ask either, you know, you, Joe, or you, Maria, what, there are a lot of possible outcomes, you know, projecting forward a year or two or five. But my question is, is there an outcome that's even legally possible when an as of right builder who owns a building is operating this kind of service? Is there a way that they can be decertified or is there any regulatory means to remove them? And then I'd like yeah. to comment. Yeah, there is no as of right builder. This was a publicly supported project with public funds and private investment through low income housing tax credits. The crux of our problem, there's twofold. One is Lantern is a social service provider and keeps talking about only social services as opposed to also building management and the basic things you have to do to have a building like this fit into a block. And the second thing is, is that they made a choice to have a, some service contracts that refer to them the most social service needy tenants. I think the change we can seek to make in working with Lantern as the provider and owner and with the speaker's office is to see if some of those contracts can be changed. So in fact, going forward, the referrals they get are not so deeply needy of social services and therefore not able to be managed and managed on a residential block. Thank That's, you, Joe. You, you, you said that eloquently. I think we could put that in the letter. <laughs> okay. Because, because I think what, what's missing and I think what you've heard from everyone else, and I'm just going to echo, and the two sentences I would point us to uh, is line, sorry, I lost it. Line 71 says, whatever possible measures to provide a more suitable match of facility for these tenants would be supported by the community. It just sounds very sort of, you know, non-committal. It's like, yeah, we'd like that. Um, so maybe a little James more forceful there. And then okay. the other sentence was uh, MCB4 continues to be welcoming of supportive housing units in our uh, housing sites in our district. Great clause. But with the right balance, operational capability, and most importantly, the appropriate services for populations served. Again, that's just a statement of 
of aspiration. It would be nice if we said, as, and I don't know if this is too strong, but I just offer this as a friendly amendment, you know, as currently executed, Lantern is not, you know, executing at that level. Or something. I think I'm getting, I'm getting the sense of the committee. We just want to make something very clear in here to say that Lantern, in the way it's approaching this building and operating this building, is just not working right. and creating a lot of community. Like, just like just to a very simple to the point, it's not working. That's all I got. Right, everybody? Can I get a nod from people? Yep. Yes? Yep. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, let's go to Dolores. Dolores? I'm here. Sorry about that. Um, so just um, about the letter itself, the letter reflects the tone that we had at that original meeting. Clearly uh, things in the neighborhood have uh, deteriorated, not just mm -hmm. because of Lantern, but because of uh, the massive amount of uh, relocation that's happened into the Hell's Kitchen area. So that exacerbates a lot of the agitation and the discomfort that many of us feel. Um, I think what's important here is that we did capture the initial sentiment from that committee meeting in this letter. Obviously, you're hearing from everybody, we'd like stronger language to reflect. I don't think it is appropriate for us to add, Maria, the new information that you had at the CAB meeting, because that wasn't presented uh, to the, the, the committee at the time that we wrote the letter. But I do think that we should be bringing up um, a refresher conversation on this at our next meeting and a follow-up. And if there have been no significant improvements, uh, we write an even stronger letter. So I think we take the time to just change the language in this to reflect that we don't have that much confidence in the part of the management of the property. And uh, we don't add all the extra bullet points on all the things we've learned new, because I think that we need to give a little bit of time to find out wh what has been the change, what have been the uh, uh, attempts at amendment by Lantern uh, for us to follow up on. And we should also note this is taking an incredible amount of time from the Block Association, Community of Art Office, and all the elected officials. Way out of proportion to any of our other supportive housing uh, developments in, this, in, in our district. But Michael? Joe, Joe, could I add just a comment? Wait, I just, I'm sorry. Go on to Michael next. I'll come back to you, Leslie. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Joe, stop. Wait, one second. Dolores, just really quick, uh, you mentioned something about not adding something in the letter. Did you mean... Just not adding the new information because this is the you letter from the, February. The this security is the, part, right? Yeah, it's okay. That's just my about suggestion. Cab, that's all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that that's, a, that's for our follow-up. That's just my thought. Okay. Anything else? Okay, Michael, Noble. You there, Michael? If Michael's not here, then, oh, here he is. Go ahead. We can't hear you, Michael. Hello. You just hear a little bit of noise, not much. Uh. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Michael. Thank you. Uh, that must have been my dog uh, making noise. I didn't have anything to say. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Sorry, I didn't mute myself. Sorry. Let's go to let's go to Martin Tree. Martin, any comments on the letter? I remember the days of Aladdin and Aladdin is there and I am trusting them but I do have a question after the bullets who does that after the I missed the word Martin try it again after the bullets, who does the bullets, the cabin, or someone else, lantern, presumably. But Are you getting the word? Everybody. 
make this right. And that is the cab. Martin, are you asking about the selection process for the cab? Uh, no. Okay. I, the bullets. The That's the word, we're, uh, Martin. Martin, we're missing that word. You, we're, what we're hearing is bullets. It's not what you're saying. Oh, Say it again. Uh, in this letter, there are bullets. Oh, bullets. The bullets that we yeah. talked about. Oh, oh, From the original <laughs> letter, the bullets. The, the original letter was, was just a list of bullets which we voted on back in February. Who That's does a, that? Who did oh, the that letter? That was our letter. That was our letter, Martin. That was our letter. That was our letter back in, that was the board's letter in February, and it was supposed to be reworded and brought to the March meeting, which didn't happen. That's the reason. The cab will discuss the issue of uniforms, right? Yes, because one of the issues was that Lantern wanted uniform uh, uh, security, and some of the tenants felt not good about uniform security. That came up at our meeting back in February. Ooh. So that the tenants uh, in a meeting of the cab in a meeting at the housing committee. Yeah. Uh, we do it. Yeah, the tenants came to our meeting and they brought that up. All right, I call the question. So Let, let's go back to Leslie. He had his hand up to comment again. Uh, Leslie? It's, it's, it's an overall question. Uh, we're now with the situation with Lantern, but going forward as a board, we really should be looking holistically of the new organizations that come into our neighborhood and the overall impact on all of us. It not only impacts my block, but restaurants, uh, hotels, everything along the street is impacted by situations like this. And as we get out of COVID, it's critical that we keep the, the area moving. What I like to do is just sum up all the comments. Basically, people feel that we need to make this letter stronger, making it clear that they don't have a lot of confidence in Lantern. We should recognize the board has worked with the cab and Lantern elected officials to try to move this ahead. It is very slow, it is very painful, and the situation is not resolved. Also, I want to note that it's the minority of tenants here that are troublesome. And the problem is those minority are making it worse for everyone in the building and the block. You should note that because that's accurate. And then that it is just not working. We need to reconceive it, especially about the referral issue that they should use, get referrals that are less social service needy. Does that sum up the comments for everybody? Just shake your head if that's yes. Yes. Okay. So motion Martin, Martin A to accept the letter. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand visually. Okay, thank you all very much. And that was our easy one. So we're gonna to go to, Maria's gonna give us some background on the next item, and then we're gonna talk about how, how we had some internal discussion, how to respond to this. Maria? Um, so I'll just give briefly um, what has happened in the past week. Not even a week, because tomorrow's Friday. And so last Friday, uh, community board office and the speaker's office found out that the WJ Hotel, uh, which is on 51st Street between 8th and 9th Avenue, is pretty much adjacent to Lantern, except for a very small restaurant in between, that that hotel has been filled with approximately 140 men that come from two shelters downtown. Um, it's the, the reason for the relocation is obviously related to COVID and that they're sleeping in congregate settings downtown, so they need to move them into individual rooms. So approximately 143 men on 51st Street, that happened Friday, we found out about it, the board and the speaker's office, after the move had already begun. Um, and that was 
not only myself, but whenever anybody found out about it, including Lowell can attest to it, Joe, we were all flabbergasted, we were in shock. Um, the feeling was that that was not the place where it should have been moved to. And if the community board had been made aware, we could have suggested another location um, in the community that would not have, I would say such a detrimental impact on the residents that already live on that block. Um, the other thing I just wanna add is that, you know, it's a quality of life issue, but to a, at a certain point, it becomes about people's emotional and mental well-being who live on that block. Um, and I just feel like it, in the role that I have being a co-chair of the community board, um, that I have, and even though I, my profession, I'm a social worker and I work with populations like that in the past, um, I feel that my role in this seat is that I'm supposed to be, you know, advocating for what it is that the community residents want. And so, you know, I'll leave the rest to Joe. Maria, if I could- I, I, I wanna make I, a, oh yeah, can, I wanna make a note. I, yeah. I apologize. I forget I'm not sitting in a room with a bunch of people in front of me so I can see who was raising their hand. And I wanna return for one short moment, please hold Maria's thought to the lantern letter any public comments? We have two people who have raised their oh, hands. Right. We were supposed to Nelly, do that. We, we really apologize to everybody. Nelly, can Sorry. you recognize them, please? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have Jennifer who raised her hand first. I will give her permission to speak. And please state uh, who you are and where you're from, okay? Hi, Jennifer Ophir. I'm a resident of 350 West 51st. Um, Nelly, and I know Jesse's not on the call, but I submitted. Um, videos and photographs of about 10 different various incidents of individuals that have been posing a problem, uh, drug use, drug sales, uh, people sleeping in the doorway of the entrance. Um, it's all pretty much in that letter. Those are just the highlights. So I hope that letter is going to be entered into the conversation and uh, yes, documented. Jennifer, I have it. Yes, Jennifer, I have it. I have it printed before me. I was going to actually mention it right before we get the public comment about the WJ. Okay. Yeah, so so what we can do, Jennifer, is we can we can make some some specific notes about things that have been seen there and include that as part of a letter. Is that okay? Okay. And there's photo, photos and video, so. Yeah, we won't be able to, to include. Documentation. We, we can refer to them, we won't be able to include them. Okay, please refer to it. And then I have an amendment I'd like to make. I know you already voted on the letter, but. Um, right, but as a, in general, from the public, you can make an amendment, you just talk about it and we can take it into consideration. All right, I will let you know my, what I think, uh, line 21. Okay. Um, This SRO site poses serious quality of life concerns. That is an understatement. It should read something to the effect of this SRO poses violent behavior and belligerent threats from some of their residents towards law abiding residents of the block, illegal drug use and drug sales out in the open and serious quality of life issues such as noise levels and disrespect to the neighborhood. I just feel like line 21 is uh, kind of hidden and it really needs to be a stronger statement because quality of life all... is just a term that can be thrown around at this point. All of New York is a quality of life concern um, unless you're on the Upper East Side. So um, yeah, I think that should be broadened I think the committee agrees with you on that, and we're going to make that stronger anyway. It may not be talking about law-abiding citizens, but we're going to make it stronger so it's clear that the quality of life has seriously been compromised on the block because of the lantern folks. Okay? Seriously compromised, and um, it, it affects not only our mental health, but our, our physical safety. Thank you, Jennifer. And Joe, it looks like there's one more person who wants to speak about lantern. Yes. Ziv? Nelly, can you recognize that person? Uh, yes, I have two people. Hold on one oh, second. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was looking at the Q&A. Who's the next person, Nellie? 
The next person is uh, someone by the name of Ziv, and I will give permission to speak now. Thank you, Hi, everyone. Um, I also happen to live across uh, the lantern, um, and you know, while everyone already spoke about harsher and, and stronger rewards, I believe that without um, you know definitive goals and timelines pushing lantern uh, to make an actual change, I'm not sure anything is going to move. I mean, uh, words are words, and you know, just just as as we saw. The Jefferson Hotel just moved people in. They did not send letters. They did not ask anyone. They, they took an action. We need to take an action. We need to set timelines. We need to set the goals. You know, number of residents that are, you know, extremely difficult. You know, I, I, I feel for them. But honestly, I feel for, for myself, my wife, and my uh, building more. Mm -hmm. um, this neighborhood has been taking, you know, those cases uh, more that it can absorb, it seems, in the last couple of years. Quality of life deteriorating. I know people, um, like regular people, you know, like myself who have been leaving uh, the neighborhood. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure it will be sustainable on, on the long term if, if, you know, if we just speak and they do, um, you know. I, I, I thought we, we can change the name of the neighborhood to just kitchen, but the hell is back. So not sure what can be done. And uh, yeah, just to continue uh, James's words, I mean, I don't know how there's nothing that can be done on like the city level with some laws or regulations to literally, you know, push them out of here. Um, as so it doesn't sound to, good, I, I, but. I need to let you know that we don't have any ability to push anybody out of anywhere. No, it's not what we can do. However, we can have people, we can have not-for-profits operating supportive housing in a responsible <clears throat> way that has no impact whatsoever on the surrounding community. We also cannot put deadlines because we have a difficult situation here that's been created and has to be resolved. It does not mean it makes it any easier for anybody living there. I really thank you for your comments. Thanks. You want to go to the next person, uh, Nelly? Yes, we have one other person. It's a caller and I will allow them to speak now. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Alex Walliver. I live at 350 West 51st Street. Um, I'd just like to kind of clarify a few points. Uh, first of all, um, the issue of uh, security at Stardom Hall and them coming to the committee in October um, I was one of the residents that was against it, and, and the reason we were against it was because of the fact that they already had a current guard out there in the evenings, five days a week, that was um, not productive, not able to do anything, um, and that they were asking for an additional funding, public funds, to support not only that current guard, but then a guard for the other two days of the week. And that is why we were against it. It was not because we didn't want uniformed um, uh, security guards out there that, that could actually do something. Um, but, you know, they are, uh, and we have well, you know, it's been well documented how ineffective um, they are. So I just wanted to, to clarify that. And I also mentioned that that was brought up in the October meeting. I've been alerting uh, Lantern and our elected officials, including members of CB4, about the issues with stardom since July of 2019 and Lantern themselves since March of 2018, including the infamous Yeller. So I understand the circumstances that we are in given the outbreak of COVID-19, but the severity of the problems that we are experiencing have only just been exasperated. They have been ongoing for two years now. And I just, just want to, I just want to reiterate that point that what we have been dealing with is not something that just came up in your February meeting or not something that came up in a, in a December CAC meeting or CAB meeting or whatever you want to call them. I've been meeting with CB4 and Corey Johnson's office and everybody else since long before that. I went in front of CB4 in your full November meeting and talked about these issues. And I just think it's appalling that it is now 
the end of May and you guys are just voting on a letter citing how poorly this establishment is run. I'm sorry to it interrupt is. you, but in fact, the letter was voted yes. on in February. It was approved. And because of COVID, the final text was delayed until this meeting. This letter was voted okay. on in February. Okay, and then thank we, you. And then we all, signed, we all kind of went sideways for, for these cover months. So I apologize for that, but it is our current circumstance. Yeah, I mean, I, I've also submitted a, a, a letter to Nellie, which I hope will be entered to the record. Thank you very Thank much. You. Any, any further comments on the Lantern letter? If there are none, we're going to return to I the... Have, no, I have one other person that has a raised hand. Yes, go ahead. Greg yeah. Lynn. Thank you. Yep. Now I'm moving. Yes. Uh, Greg Lynn from 350 West 50th Street. Uh, I live on a block uh, uh, just down the street. I do want to go back to the letter specifically and also s similarly to other residents have, m have mentioned as well, specifically that we do need to state within the letter or I would recommend that the committee consider um, specifically talking about drug sales and drug usage and public drug usage on the block and the surrounding corners. It has really increased the uh, quality of life um, and, and such. The corner of 51st and uh, 8th, going down to 50th and 8th, is consistently with residents who are selling drugs, using drugs, putting it in our neighborhood. As this is a taxpayer, as we're using taxpayer money and public funds, I would also suggest, and a recommendation if we could, that similar to how we operate in condos and co-ops with house rules, and, and how we need to operate as citizens, there should be criteria that if you are to be receiving public funds and using public facilities, that you too should be uh, required to have periodic drug testing. Okay, so uh, that is not a requirement in support of housing, but I want to note that the issue we have here is we have a, schism, we have a sort of a divided lantern. They own the building, but they're the social service providers and the community board has been very clear to them. It doesn't matter if they're the providers, they own the building and they're responsible to responsible neighbors both within and outside of the building. I think we, should, we can make a, a broad note about drug activity increasing, but again, we cannot specifically say that drug activity on a corner is directly linked to this because we don't have the absolute evidence for it. We can note as the prior speaker noted that she has pictures and we can bring that up, but we can't be so specific without being very, very clear, without having I'll, the facts. I'll, I'll take the data that comes from the police department and we can submit that for next meeting. Yes, yes, no, that's very helpful as, 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 a, as a broad piece. Thank you very much. No other, um, Nelly, no other? Joe, Joe I was gonna ask, so, so where, I see, I mean, Alex already spoke, but I do have Alex's letter here um, that he's been a resident. I don't know if he said that, that he's been a resident for 12 years, I'm assuming he did, but. Um, do you need me to mention some of the letter? I, no, I, think, I, I, think, I think we've gotten from the sense of the committee and the speakers to pump up this letter with more dissatisfaction and make it as, as strong as possible without, it, without making any claims that we can't support. That, that's one of our issues. Dolores has her hand raised. So we've already, we want to make sure the public has heard on this. We voted on it. We're taking a few more changes. Dolores, go ahead. I just wanted to um, make a note just for those that may be new to participating at a community board meeting. Now that we have Zoom, we actually uh, are probably getting more participation. Community boards were advisory only. Um, we reflect as much as possible the needs and the concerns of the community, but our power is in making that voice heard. We actually don't change the laws. So I think it's important for folks to understand that it's, it's not that we as the community board are preventing anything from moving further or moving faster. Um, we work with the resources that we can, which is combining not just our voice, but the voice of the electeds, the voice of other agencies, as, as well as block associations and the police uh, when it is appropriate. So I just wanted folks to understand uh, our power is limited. Um, but we are better when we work collectively, and that's what we're trying to do. 
So let's Mary. return to the WJ. Maria left very eloquently, talking about her profession and role as a social worker, but knowing that our role here is to, is to re represent our community. And I think this is a great example of where we need to frame this discussion as opposed to have the incident frame us. The fact that on a block that has had serious issues with a, a, a homeless and supportive housing population, with the Wynn uh, building with 60 people on it, at it, and roughly 102 people at the uh, Lantern building. The fact that the city of New York would work with a not-for-profit under the COVID-19 public health crisis, which is the most horrific time we've spent in any of our lives, I think we can all agree upon that, and without any discussion or consultation, move 140 shelter residents in from the Bowery is a absolutely bad public policy move and a bad community move and a bad social service move. When I heard about this information well after the fact, I was just shocked for a couple of reasons. First, Project Renewal runs Geffner House on 42nd Street and the residents on 48th Street. They know our community board very well. We work with them for decades. They know us. If there was a question that there should be a, a move for the shelter population to our district, they should have picked up the phone, called the chair, called the council member, and made that discussion right away. All of us in this COVID-19 public health crisis know we have to pitch, pitch in and do stuff above and beyond. There's no question. However, it's the location that is the problem for this, not the fact that there is a deep emergency need. And what I want to just make clear, Lowell, yes? I, I, I finish up, Joe. I just I can give you the timeline exactly because I don't know if everyone knows the timeline of exactly yeah. what we, happened we, we here. We should probably, probably do the timeline again. That when you, we have people in congregate shelters at risk of life because of COVID-19, yes, if we have empty hotels somewhere in our district, that's possible to talk about where can we fit it in or make it happen for a, a temporary period. But the idea that the Department of Homeless Services and HRA would choose this block with this incredible difficult burden that's been going on for a number of years to move people in and then notify, and then we find out, that's just a poor move from every, every end. So Lowell, give us the timeline, then I wanna come back and talk about this in general. Okay, so as far as the community, what we have learned over the last week, um, I don't know when the, the uh, DHS, Homeless Department of Homeless Services, identified the WJ, but we do know that as early as May 12th, Project Renewal was looking at the WJ to see if it was suitable for them. So that was Tuesday the 12th. On Friday the 15th at 9 a.m., they started moving residents in. At noon on Friday was the first notification that either the community board or Speaker Johnson's office received. We received Correct. a call from DHS at noon, three hours after they started moving people in, that they were using this shelter. We immediately asked for a meeting um, with DHS and with Project Renewal. By two o'clock, all of the residents were moved in. We were on the phone with Project Renewal by 5.30, and we went through you know, our major concerns about this. Um, Speaker Johnson's office arranged for NYPD to be on site 24 seven on Friday. We had, and, and, and that we had two calls this week, um, one with some of the people on this, on this call, um, one with Project Renewal and some of the people on this call. I also had a call with our district manager with DHS and we again reiterated to DHS that this was outrageous, that this was done um, without any notification. But we didn't find out until at least three days before Project Renewal found out about this. And we did not find out about this until after the move-in had already started. And I just want everyone to be aware of that, that as soon as we found out, the community board jumped into action to register our displeasure with this um, in very strong terms. But you know, we did not have any advance notice either. Now, Lowell, because, a quick question. Uh, does Corey uh, Johnson? Let, 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 Leslie, one, one second. I, want, I'm, I have a little more to put out here because I think we, I want to give this in a very different direction than, 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 we, than the other one. The first thing is, is that I'm sorry, I apologize to folks. Maria has been covering this with uh, Lowell since in my work at Clinton Housing. I've been deeply involved in COVID 19 issues and have not been able to participate at all. When I learned of this, 
my response was very clear. The fact that there is now uh, Project Renewal has hired a government relations firm, Azira, to represent them in this matter. I'm sorry. Everyone knew this was going to be done and it was not disclosed. I do not believe we should be engaging with Project Renewal nor DHS about how to make this better. It is clear to me as a provider and a builder of supported housing and providing social services to the Crutzing Guild, this, does, this facility, even temporarily, does not belong at this location. And that's what I want the committee members to start talking about before we open it up to the public. And we need as a community board to give alternative locations to move this population, which has a desperate need, there is no question. But just because DHS and HRA made a bad policy decision and signed a contract to accommodate people doesn't mean that we have to say, that's fine, let's make it better. There's no way to make this one better. And I think we have to say, stop. So I wanna put that thought out for discussion among the committee members. Now, Leslie, take it away. Yes, I agree 100%. And what we should be doing is saying they need to be moved from this location. We do not need them on this block. It's not acceptable. They're destroying the quality of life for our residents. Uh, they're devastating the business community along with everything else. Uh, it's gonna affect Broadway, the banks in the neighborhood. Uh, and we vote. This community will vote. So let's, let's, let's go around the table and talk about it further. Let's go to Jessica. Uh, I don't know that I have um, all that much to add. I mean, I have serious concerns. Um, I do, I am curious about, I, I shared with Maria, um, as she introduced this as an issue for me, um, that I would be curious to know how the program was received when it was downtown, what issues were possibly known. Um, you know, it could be that the, that operation has, it does a really good job of managing um, their building and the residents there. So obviously a new environment that can introduce a lot of other issues, but I would, I would be interested to know if, if, I don't know if they were in CB1, I don't know exactly where downtown they were. Community board um, three. If we Valerie. could find out uh, um, anything about just, you know, past experience, um, I think that would be helpful, but um, I share your concern and certainly the concerns uh, of the people on the block. Paul? Unmute, Paul. I'm gonna, yeah, there. Yeah, um, you know, uh, we, we've heard a lot of stories, Joe, over the many years that we've been doing this. This one's a little bit more than shocking. Uh, I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. Uh, it's almost like no good deed goes unpunished. We have been so welcoming to so many institutions for such a long time. And the reward is to turn 51st Street into a dumping ground, it sounds like, to someone who lives around the corner. Uh, I thank you all for digging your heels in. And uh, you know, this sort of goes back, to, this, may not, this is in direct attack to that, but what I was going to ask or meant to say about Lantern, you know, the, the residents who have supplied photographs, et cetera. Is there some way we can attach any of that and send it along with the letter? Letters are great. We write pretty good letters. But you know, there are some things that only yeah, pictures Paul, can really communicate. We, yeah, we agreed on that, Paul, already. We have already. And we've already passed this along to someone else yes. aside from us. Let, can, you stay okay. with this, can you stay with this issue? Yeah, well, that was my issue. I mean, if, if, if one picture is horrible, two is even worse. I, you know, you're adding this picture to the already existing pictures on this block. I, uh, my heart goes out to everyone who lives on West 51st Street. I'm sorry, that's why I have the offer you this one, but. Oh, it is shocking how that can just happen. And I did want to add that there, we were to discuss there are two schools on that, on that block also. So I think that uh, looking at how deteriorating the neighborhood is and for the community, as um, we were just talking about, is important documentation for what's happening. It's not only affecting the neighbors, but the schools and, and businesses, et cetera. So I agree. Betty? Um, I agree with you, Joe. I think it's beyond outrageous. I think what we need to do is to uh, fo two focuses. One focus maybe is later on, 
about the um, lack of communication with us and that kind of thing. The other is um, why this site is wrong. And you know I love maps. So, you know, maybe it would be very good if this is where this is located. This is where the wind place is. This is where the lantern place. This is where the two schools are and show this is a heavily impacted area already. So that would be one recommendation I have. And the other is if we have some suggested alternative locations, let's put them in a map too. And say, look, just only two blocks away or something, you have these other opportunities and it's not an impacted block. So that's, I'd like to have some tools along with this. And Joe, as you suggested before, in the, con the start of the conversation, just to right, mention but, quickly, very quickly. But, you mentioned Leslie, before, Joe, have, have people that's spoken COVID. Yet. I'm going around the table. So, so I'm going, okay. to, going to Pete next. Uh, I'll go back to you. Okay, uh, this is Pete. Uh, having the experience of uh, going uh, through what 51st Street is going through now, I, 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 <laughs> my heart goes out to them. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I have a lot more people there than, than I do on my, on my, in my building. Um, I, I, I don't know how they came to the conclusion that this is, would be the best place, especially knowing that there are other facilities, women in need, uh, uh, the next door neighbors, uh, uh, and uh, Washington Jefferson. Uh, I believe that it originally was um, a residency for uh, as an SRO as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been uh, a tourist hotel for a long time, Pete. But before yeah, that, it was right, yeah. right, yeah. and um, and uh, it, it baffles me that decisions were made um, the way they were. I know that in other boroughs, it's the same situation, um, but I, I I don't know where. I really don't know where these uh, homeless people came from at this point. Lowell? There's so many. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry, Pete. I That's can just an I can answer one of Pete's questions because we did raise this with DHS. What DHS explained to us is they are filling these hotels from the largest hotel to the smallest hotel in that order without regard to location. They admitted that much to us. Wow. That's a sound policy. Yeah. Let's go, Sarah. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah, just um, to answer something Pete said, there are about approximately 20, 20, 23 permanent residents at the WJ. Oh, from from before, it was an SRO before it became a, a, a tourist hotel. Got it. Sarah? Gosh, that's just so super disappointing, especially the statement you just made, Lowell. Um, I agree with you, Joe. Uh, Betty, I love the idea of a map. I'm a visual person too. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, and I, I like the suggestion of, you know, do we have any other alternatives that we're able to, to suggest, uh, you know, where would those be? And what does that look like? I think we should, I'm, we're already jumping on this, but, you know, ready to get to work on this. Hector, you're next. Yeah. Um... This is a very touchy situation, obviously, that we've been dealing with all around. Um, I think it's outrageous, just like everybody else, <laughs> pretty much everybody else's voice. Um, I think we have to deal with this uh, in a very harsh manner, because honestly, this is going to set a precedent that, I mean, it almost sounded like they used the COVID, that this was in the works already, and they used the COVID-19 uh, pandemic to rush this along and, you know, um, use a backdoor entrance to get this pushed through very quickly, and, and that's where why we're at where we're at right right, right now. Um, in the letter, we need to really be basic, basically nip this in the butt and say, hey, um, uh, this cannot be allowed to happen again or proceed, and we need to find out a timeline as to when this is going to end, when that that particular location is going to be shut down, if at all, at this point. Uh, concerning sheltering the homeless, uh, you know, uh, and, and I guess uh, that goes to Betty's idea about creating the map about finding a different location for them uh, in a more immediate fashion. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we definitely have to make sure this uh, does not continue and also to make sure it doesn't happen again, obviously, because uh, it's, a, it's a very distinct possibility. I mean, honestly, um, the way the mayor is pushing through and the uh, government officials are pushing through that 
uh, by clearing out the subways and other locations to keep them uh, in an effort of keeping the homeless safe as well, along with everybody else, which I agree with. They're, they're sheltering them wherever they can find a, a space for them. And, right. uh, and they, but Hector, you know, I, want, I want to note that, that this was a stupid move and a stupid idea, but yeah, it was not premeditated. These are congregate men shelters that serve yeah. very social service needy populations on the Bowery. And they were in a right. congregate setting and for health reasons, they needed to move them. But where they move them is our issue. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, but basically, they must have had this in mind at some point. I mean, you say- No, I believe it just, I believe having worked with DHS now in the past three months, yeah, no plan, they're doing their best, and they make good decisions and a lot of bad ones at the same time. Yeah, but again, they did it in such a quick manner without even notifying anybody. That's, that's the, the difference, that's yep. the problem there, you know, um, and that's where we have to uh, make sure it doesn't happen again, hopefully. Uh, and, and any kind of letter we, we generate here has to stress that because honestly, it's that that poor neighborhood is getting slammed uh, with more, you know, a, a bad, uh, a bad situation there. Because I, I like I said, I, I live over here in, in Chelsea, and uh, there's a bunch of homeless shelters nearby and and soup kitchens, and uh, I, I I fully understand what they're going through, and that seems like a really bad situation there. So and that's how I like feel about. It. So let's go. Let's go to James Wallace next. Yeah, I don't want to uh, repeat what's been said. Uh, obviously, there's a level of uh, concern and outrage about the lack of notice. I want to echo Sarah's support for Betty's uh, comments, and I'm concerned about um, the alternatives. And I want to ask Lowell, um, since this has been, you know, late in the game as far as them notifying us, have we explored any? alternative locations, number one, and number We're two. talking about this for the first time, James, the night in public. Nothing has really happened. No, our I, first, our I, first go. I understand this is our first public meeting, but when was CB4 notified? We were notified, we were notified at noon on Friday wow. and the immediate, because we knew we weren't going to get these men out, you know, overnight. The first, our first reaction was to reach out to Project Renewal, make sure they understood what was going on here and let them know what we expected of them over last weekend. We've spoken to them, you know, this week as well. And, and to, to, you know, to try and address some of the issues that have come up. And like I said, we also, I also spoke to DHS about, you know, the more overriding issues. So we've been engaging with Project Renewal to try and make this as good as possible while they're there. And we've been engaging with DHS to try and get them out. We've been okay. running parallel tracks. Thanks for your we, have not, we have not suggested any other locations because- we'll at, that at, in a moment. Yeah, at the, at, but you know, given the time that we've had to deal with this, it made more sense to delay the, to this committee meeting tonight. Well, thanks for your quick action. And I guess the next question is just drilling down on Betty's suggestion of alternative locations. Obviously, you need a willing hotel. So my question would be, I know that's, that's somebody else's job per se, but it would, uh, it would certainly bolster our position if you know, someone had the opportunity or the wherewithal to contact you know, hotels that are open to this sort of thing. I mean, is there a, is there a list that they're working from in the city yeah, James, we'll come to Loris in one second. There is no list. I think it's up to us as a community to suggest locations that are not gonna create another problem. So that's what I wanna to get to after we go around the room. Dolores is next. Okay, so the police precinct council meeting for Midtown North had over 70 people on Tuesday. A, a majority of the concerns and issues were the actions taken by DHS and the administration. Outrage is at a minimum, but the, Issue here is people are focused on the notification and the size. This should not be in this neighborhood at all for right. two reasons. One, we're at capacity. But two, there's no opportunity to provide any social services in these types of hotels that are on these narrow streets. Locations, you wanna hear locations? You have entire hotels, some which are gonna be bankrupt and are filing for bankruptcy as we speak in Times Square. It is a large area that actually has a large police presence where social distancing can be helped by NYPD. You also have large conference rooms in all of these, all of these hotels, which can serve as a staging area for social service professionals to provide the services that are required 
to help these folks so that they can go ahead and be treated and hopefully moved on to permanent housing because that's ultimately the goal. Mm -hmm. The other areas, Grand Central, empty hotels there. Garment District, where there are no residents, there are areas there where there are hotels. And you ask about what hotels, the city needs to be applying pressure on hotels that will not be seeing tourists for months, maybe even a year. The city needs to leverage that. The issue here is there are opportunistic operators who do not care about the neighborhood, who raise their hand. This is very lucrative for them. They have no revenue whatsoever. The revenue is coming from the city who is desperate to ensure the safety of these residents who are in very small uh, quarters and they have a legal responsibility to ensure that they do not get exposed to COVID in those types of conditions. So the city needs to pressure these larger chains that are in these empty areas. You have Penn Station, you have Grand Central, you have parts of the Garment District, and you also have Grand Central, which are non-residential, that have the space to provide appropriate, and that's the key, it's appropriate hotel space. The hotels on our narrow streets in Hell's Kitchen are not appropriate for this population. I mean, for example, James, there is a row of budget hotels along West 40th Street between 8th and 9th Avenues, opposite of the Port Authority. Those hotels are empty, except one as first responders. There are roughly 1,500 rooms on one block. You think it might be able to accommodate a few people? Oh, the fact that, that they were dumped here is really, is, is really embarrassing and really not a good discussion to have. If I, could have a if I could have a follow up, because I really didn't finish my thought. Right. I, I, there's no doubt that, that you know, we're all fully in favor of it being in another location. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that the hotel could force, or the city could force a hotel to take in these residents, even with the promise of compensation. But I do think certainly there are willing hotels who may not even know that this opportunity is available to them. Exactly. Some exactly. hotels, to Dolores's point, you know, you really can't pressure them because you know they're they're free market capitalist you know functions, and unless you know you use eminent domain or something like. But I imagine that we wouldn't have to do that. That's my point. And, and I think there are many hungry hotel operators absolutely. who will take who will take people in order to bring income in in the meantime. Absolutely. And, and by the way, I would like to offer to call some of them because we work with hotels all the time. Uh, and, and we know a lot of hotel operators and hotel management companies. Whatever we can do to help is great. Uh, uh, Patricia? Yeah, hi. I, um, I don't have much more to add except that, you know, this, I, I think that any, um, I'm looking forward to, to the discussion of where else it can go. I think Times Square, those hotels there are, is a really interesting thought and obviously surprised and shocked that um, this all went forward without any involvement from the community, but same, same as everyone else here. Michael Noble, our last committee member. Michael, anything to add? Maybe Michael's dog? Uh, no, no, Michael? Sir. No, hey, generally, but just for the record, I'm not a committee member. Somebody slid me over as a committee. I'm just a, bo a board member, okay? Okay, fine, not a problem. Okay, but I'm enjoying it. Thanks, thanks for having <laughs> me. <laughs> so so what, I, what I wanna do before we go, go to the public now to, to talk about this, is there a general consensus on the committee that our goal here is not to seek a plan to mitigate this at this location, but to make a very severe request that it should be relocated and then we'll figure out what has to be done in the meantime. Can I have people's assent? Yes, thumbs, somebody, yes? Thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay, great. So, uh, so what I'm gonna ask now the public, clearly uh, you are more aggravated than we are, maybe, on this, um, but you have the committee right now saying clearly that the goal is to be, have it relocated, and we are, I, I wanna, we have representation from Project Renewal, and I want to just caution everybody, especially Project Renewal, please do not, give us chapter and verse, how it's gonna be better. We are not in the moment if it's gonna be better. So let's start going through people. You can raise your hand and now Nellie will, rec will recognize you. And uh, right before we go on to the public, I just- Oh, sorry, Maria. It's okay. Just looking at the letters that I have, I realized that Jennifer- Oh, yes. 
I realized that Jennifer's letter was actually, I thought it was, I don't know why, I thought it was related to the WJ, it's related to Lantern. And she, yes. um, in her email includes pictures at, at, and 10 incidences of things that she's seen and witnessed, observed, um, that she already um, summarized when she spoke. And then there's also Gil's letter about uh, retrofitting the uh, hotel. Uh, when there's the Stardom Hall residence fewer than 50 steps away is a huge con concern for the, the neighborhood. Um, and he wrote, I'm not going to read everything because it's just, it's a lot of questions um, that are not really. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we're real. About, let's go to the, let's go to the, to the people who are here. Well, I, what I want to add is that he says the only available res uh, response could be, what were we thinking? <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking? So that's all I had to add that. So Nellie, the, the first person is a, is a phone number, right? Yes. I'm going to go in the order that I saw the hands raised. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. It's, it's Alex Walliver again. Um, I, I just want to uh, reiterate what, what Joe said, and, and thank you very much for your leadership on this and um, your, your comments about it. Uh, I think that is... Um, definitively the only way forward. Thank you. Next is Peter Sachs. Peter, you can speak now. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Peter Sachs. I'm at uh, 350 West 51st Street. Um, I've been on meetings this week with some of you and I'm happy to meet you. I have a longer letter, but you guys covered so much of it. So I want to just talk a few bullet points. Um, I want to again remind you that there are over 20 permanent residents who have leases at the WJ and their rights are being violated. And I don't think, you know, it's not fair for them. And they probably weren't even told about it either. Um, I do, we'll see. Oh, so we had a meeting with Project Renewal and I felt insulted because they brought in their lobbyist, Matt Vigiano who didn't announce that he was a lobbyist. I had to look him up and ask him if he was a lobbyist. And I said, as far as I know, the job of a lobbyist is to bribe, bully, or BS. And I, and I was just insulted that they were trying to manipulate us. Um, Project Renewal has made promises about the number of security and staff, but I really haven't seen it. I haven't seen it at all yet. In fact, there was a report of a bunch of the WJ transplants that were hanging out in front of the uh, Reba Reba, I think it was today. So that's been going on. Um, and I really, you know, obviously I think that they need to find a new location for them. Um, also what's gonna happen is the restaurants are gonna open up and they're gonna be using outdoor seating and because it's being encouraged for social distancing and with between the WJ and Lantern, and if there's anybody left from the win space, you know, that's just a recipe for disaster. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna we submit- lost you, Peter. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Go, go ahead, Peter. I think, Joe, I think that was you. Go ahead, Peter. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know where I left off, but um, I'm, I have a longer letter and I'm going to submit it. Uh, but I'm thanking you all for taking such assertive leadership on this. Uh, I'm in agreement with everything you guys are saying. So thank you. Okay, next we have Jennifer. Hi everyone, Jennifer again, um, resident 350 West 51st Street. Thank you so much, Joe, and everyone's sentiments. I thought that we weren't going to be able to get rid of these people. I thought, okay, well now we have to make it work. So I'm so happy to hear that 99% of you or 100% of you are up for fighting this. Um, I don't care, quite honestly, how Project Renewal runs their other sites because they probably don't have two other SROs uh, within yards of each other. Um, I think it's egregious and disgusting that DHS went behind our backs. 
Um, my first suggestion was frontliners. Let's get them in the WJ hotel. Um, and clearly they just wanted to hide it from all of us. It's obvious. Um, Dolores, I love your spirit and your suggestions. I'm just like, yes. Um, and now I found out how much they are, the WJ is getting. And if it's not public knowledge, I'm going to make it public knowledge now. They're getting $350,000 a month. And we were told on our call on Monday, 75% of that comes from FEMA. Um, so this is why WJ immediately accepted it. I don't know how DHS is profiting from this, but um, they are a very willing hotel. So if that funding is still available, I'm sure other hotels uh, or where, wherever that money is coming from, I'm sure other hotels would be happy to take that on. Um, and what else did I wanna say? Oh, in my letter about Lantern, the first point I included a five minute video of an interview intravenous drug user basically shooting up in under the street lamp. He was struggling to find a vein for over five minutes. I have it all on video. And uh, in the beginning of the video, uh, you see him, uh, you hear two people fighting. Those were his dealers that I witnessed him getting the heroin and that's when I started recording because I was like, what's going on? And then I see him wrapping Jennifer, up. <laughs> Jennifer, it's Maria. Is that, is he a resident? Does, a tenant? I don't think he was a resident because he then like, once he shot up, he just rode away on his city bike. Right, so he probably wasn't from the block. He probably wasn't, but I bet you the dealers were. Yeah, that would be. Saturday right. night. And I'm not saying they're from the WJ. They could be from Wynn. They could be from, I mean, there were male voices. Could be from, from Lantern. But this was horrific for me to see. Yeah. This should be reported to the NYPD and it so was. that those officers yes, can yes, follow up on that. 911 and a few of us called 911. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, they came and he had left like a minute before, um, two minutes before. But that's, I mean, this, this was horrific. This is, this is the straw. Well, forget it. There's so many straws, but this was, I mean, this is 1976 Times Square. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm back, Maria. Hi. <laughs> Jennifer just finished speaking. You next is Craig Lynn. No, next, to, uh, next I have is Eric Rosenbaum. Eric. From oh, Eric Rosenbaum from, from Project Renewal, yes. Um, hi, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Eric Rosenbaum. I, um, I run Project Renewal. Um, I'm actually very glad I got the chance to listen to all of this um, discussion before, before I, I introduced myself and Project Renewal. Um, I really appreciate that I got to hear from so many of you um, about the situation on the block um, and your, your reaction to this hotel. And, and I want to apologize for the fact that you did not hear about this until the residents were moved in. That was, that was wrong. It shouldn't have happened. Um, uh, without trying to excuse it, I'm going to, I will tell you um, kind of the story of how this happened. So, you know, at least. Um, so as you know, the city is urgently now trying to de-densify the congregate shelter system um, DHS has been moving about a thousand people a week out of shelters and into hotels. Um, they have some kind of master contract with the hotel, um, a hotel association. But I actually believe there are many hotels that are open to this, but there's no system by which hotels are being picked. It's a completely free for all process in a way. Um, we're, we're being told we have to move clients into hotels but we have, to, we have to find hotels and we don't know how to find hotels. And so there's no matchmaking process around this. Um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, 
um, this is the second, the WJ is the second hotel that we've moved into. We are moving into another hotel in, on the east side uh, next week. Um, we're being pushed pretty hard to move people as fast as we can. Uh, and it happens, it, the, the time frame from even identifying a hotel to when you move in can be as short as a week. Um, so it sounds like there's, um, I mean, it seems to you like there's um, somehow some kind of a willful not notifying, but I think a big part of this is just how fast this is all happening. Um, we've certainly learned our lesson. And so even if the city doesn't notify the neighborhood, um, when we move to our next hotel, we'll be notifying people ourselves. Um, because that, because you're right, you, you should have heard about this. E even though it might've only been 24 or 48 hours, you should have, you should have heard about it. Um, so, um, and, and I, by the way, I do believe that there are many hotels that are willing to do this um, because you're right, they're almost all empty. Um, and so anyway, um, if, uh, and if the city decides that, 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 in con that they're willing to move people from this hotel to a different hotel, Project Renewal will do what the city tells us to do. Um, we can't unilaterally make that decision on our own. That will have to come from the city because we are operating at the direction of the city on this. Um, uh, I know that some of you know who Project Renewal is. I'm gonna take just 10 seconds to tell you. Uh, Project Renewal is a, has been around for 54 years. We're one of the oldest and largest homeless service providers in the city. We have uh, seven shelters throughout the city that house about a thousand people. We also have supported housing <clears throat> that ha houses about another uh, 1,000 individuals. Um, you're right, we do have two, two facilities in the district on 48th Street and on 42nd Street, the Geffner House. Um, we also provide health care um, to homeless people in New York. I think we're probably one of the largest providers of healthcare to homeless New Yorkers. Um, and we also provide food for homeless New Yorkers. We make and deliver about 3 million meals a year throughout the city um, to our own shelters and to other shelters um, around, around the city. Um, and we're committed in every one of the places where we work to be a good neighbor. Um, so uh, whatever it is, we can do to, to make this situation work as well as possible for as long as it lasts. It's a commitment that we make. Um, I understand completely your concerns about this not being, shouldn't be on the block. Um, and if that's the decision that the city makes, we'll of course uh, work with the city to, to, to do whatever, um, to, to move if that's, what, if that's what the city says. Um, I also have Susan Dan um, here on this call Susan is our Senior Vice President of Programs, and she has oversight responsibility for the WJ Hotel. Um, and uh, she can speak to the conditions in the hotel, the residents in the hotel, where they come from, uh, how they were picked to move there, um, the staffing and the security. Um, we've shared all of that information with, uh, with some of your members on previous calls, but Susan is available um, to talk about the situation in more detail. And I think I'll stop there and, and we can both respond to questions um, if you have them for us. Well, actually, I was wondering if we could um, go on to the, I don't know if anybody has questions. I can't see everybody right now, but I was wondering if we could go on to the next public um, speaker. Okay, uh, hold on a second. Wait a minute. Uh, the next, I oh. saw James raise yes. his hand now. James? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, would it be in order to ask Mr. Rosenbaum a question? Would it be what? What did you say? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. He wants to ask Eric a question. Would it be, uh, yeah. Okay. Mr. Rosenbaum, if you're still on, um, you know, first, the apology is appreciated. Um, the explanation that the city is the one who makes a determination isn't really comforting um 
I imagine that you work very collaboratively with the city and that they wouldn't be averse if there was an alternative location found to moving the residents that you moved in at the next available opportunity instead of waiting for more community blowback. Is that a possibility or are you going to wait for the city to do something? Um, okay, can I, are you hearing me again? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, we will certainly carry this back to the city. Um, I will say I have one practical concern, um, which I'll share with you, which is that we're trying to empty out um, all of our shelters. We're opening another hotel next week. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, there are some concerns I have about our ability to do two things at once in, in this crisis. Um, but, um, if, uh, but we'll certainly carry this back to the city. Um, we don't have all of the hotel capacity that even we need to empty our shelters at this moment in time. So even, even hearing your concerns, I would probably say my first priority would be to make sure that we're reducing the density in the shelters we have. Um, and if we complete that in the next couple of weeks, then I would be open certainly to going back to the city and saying, if we can find another hotel um, that, that can accommodate this and the city's willing to say yes, we can't, we can't do it on our own, that's for sure. Does that, does that answer your question? I'm, I'm trying to be honest and realistic also. It answers my question and obviously you're gonna get a lot of support from the community board. We can't hear you, Joe, but I just yeah. wanted to answer my question. Okay. Apologize. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. I'm having very bad connection problems for some reason. So I just want to note, Eric, that um, we all are doing more than we possibly think we do right now. We're all exhausted. I understand that fully, and I appreciate it. The one thing this community has is an incredible number of hotels, more than we ever expected to see built in the garment center blocks. There literally are over 6,000 rooms at that location that have been built in the past five or six years. So the city to make sure that while you are dealing with the stress that you have in the other congregate shelters, which is very real and very present danger for people, we are not creating an unlivable situation on this block. We have worked with your organization for such a long time and ups and downs to figure things out. And that's what we expect you to do here. And we would ask you to use the power of your lobbyist to lobby the city of New York to get you to the right spot for this particular uh, two shelters to find a temporary home. Let's go to our next person and then we'll come back to Eric for more questions. Craig, Lynn, Nellie. Hi, it's Greg Lynn from 350 West 50th Street again. Um, the point that I wanted to just bring up and again, thank you for the support from the committee regarding this specific issue uh, and the sentiment that everyone seems to have as far as the disruption to the community and the abruptness of where no one was notified as a whole. Um, I think in response also to um, Project Renewal and their, and their most recent statements, I do find it concerning that you know, they're not able to look at neighboring hotels to their own facilities. Because I think one part that we're, we're also not considering here is, yes, at the same point, it is a disruption to our quality of life, but also the disruption of their own tenants from their environments, their communities, and the areas in which they have become accustomed to. So I would think that in the process of selection of hotels, understanding this is Manhattan and there are hotels everywhere, that they would be looking at locations closer proximity to where their current tenants that they are outloading from different uh, atmospheres to that. Um, I would also would like to comment that it was concerning that we heard for the first time almost about this uh, on the NYPD precinct meeting call um, by the DHS. It seemed like it was just pushed on. The buses arrived on Friday and within hours of the buses arriving, there was already two to three calls to NYPD about tenants that had just arrived. And they are there every day. There are now two to three cop cars that are out there Individuals are on the corners of 51st and 9th and 51st and 8th consistently, as well as on 50th and 
8th as well from this facility. They're congregating, they're not using masks, they're not social distancing, and they're part already coming into the community. Um, so although I do much support uh, you know, the services that we do provide from social services perspective, it was very interesting when DHS said that Manhattan borough, and we kept talking about the borough, we are extensively already overwhelmed with the amount of supportive housing right now that we have, that we're trying to support the community that we have, and the number of individual homelesses, people that we currently have on the street that we are trying to even take off our own streets right now, who are defecating all over our, our community. Thank you. Let's go, let's go next to these folks. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, everyone. So I am a new community board for member. Um, and uh, I really appreciate how difficult this situation is. I would suggest that um, uh, I think it's not going to be useful in a letter to complain about not having received a whole lot of uh, notice, because I think the pressure that's happening right now because of COVID and because of trying to get all the people off the streets and out of the subways, they're going to say, you know, guys, we all agree with you. It'd be lovely to have more notice, but it's not going to happen. So I think coming at it from a lack of notice perspective isn't going to be so successful. But I think what would be really great is for you to say, um, I mean, it sounds like uh, DHS has a list of hotels um, that have self-identified as willing to take DHS placements. I think it would be great if, um, if our community board can ask for a list of all the hotels within CB4 that have self-identified so that then you can say, look, you know, great. Um, you know, we know there are so many hotels. It's great that these have self-identified. We encourage you to even look at these others in the garment district or whatever. But here's why we think that these six hotels should come off your list or two hotels should come off your list. But I think, um, acknowledging we should acknowledge that we know that we're going to have placements at hotels in our community board and that that is not what we're complaining about that right. we understand the importance of getting people off the streets right now what we are complaining about is um the fact that we should have been given some even if it is uh you know 24 hours notice we can help um let dhs know um you know how to be more responsible about this process. Um, and, um, but I also know that, you know, these, uh, the providers who are already working with the homeless and who are now having to move people off the streets, they do not have the time to go off and also identify more hotels. I think this really is on the city and on DHS specifically. And we need to tell them that, uh, you know, to just work with us and we're happy to look at the list of hotels and to let them know which ones are best. Just for clarification purposes, Katie, these yep. are not people coming off the streets. These are two. Right, you're right. I should have been more specific. For many years. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and we're moving a shelter population, right. which was identified, right. getting services there. So that's why, of yep. course, they need to be moved. And I think yep. we have to make that clear. It's a public yep. health crisis, for it. not a joke. Exactly. But and I think, and just to be. We not talk to each other at the same time. Joe, yeah. if, I could, if I could respond a little bit further. Katie, part of the problem is that DHS will not give us the list of hotels they are considering. And that's why the notice portion is important to raise because they'll only tell us when they're ready to do it. And so what we, what we specifically told DHS is if you had given us any kind of notice here, we would have told you right then and there, you can't do this, find another spot before these people were moved in. So if, if we had and a we'll list of hotels and we could you. say, check, check off these, yeah, and we'll work with you. But if, if they had given us a list of, they, they won't give us the list of hotels yeah. to check and say, these are the good ones, these are the ones you should stay away from. So we're, we're okay. at a drawback, we're, you know, we're, we're at a disadvantage there, and that's why notice is important. Yeah, there I see that, and I guess the thing, I, I'm sorry, what, Joe? There is bad public management. That's one of our problems here. It's not not-for-profits. It's DHS as a press against the wall. It doesn't mean the normal give and take you have in an agency. We work with these agencies every day. Pick up right. the phone, call the council member, call the community yeah. board chair and say, here's a problem. They know how to do that. They chose not to. That's pretty yeah, clear. 
they did not call us. They did not call Corey's office. I, I was standing with Eric Botcher when he got the call about noon on, on uh, that Friday. Yeah. All right. And I, I guess I would just say that I think we just do have to be clear in the letter. We are not objecting to these shelters being de-densified into community board four. We're just trying to be very responsible about which hotels are chosen. Yeah, I, they I, are I, temporary. I, it's all about temporary. Right, it's, exactly. it's, it's temporary. One of the points I made the first call we had with project renewal is because they, they keep using the word de-densifying. They're de-densifying the shelter, but they're doing it by, you know, increasing the density, but they're doing it by densifying 51st Street, which just doesn't fly. Leslie Murphy's next. Hi guys, it's good to see you in uh, your own uh, setting. Um, I am also a member of CB4, not obviously on this committee. Uh, it's understood that you realize the severity of the situation, um, but I just wanted to put my comments on the record uh, living in that community. First, I wanna thank the chairman. Um, Lowell, I wanna thank you because you brought this up directly to uh, Gail Brewer and in no uncertain terms, you voiced our concern and our anger and I really appreciate that um, and how you did it. I thought was uh, was wonderful. Um, also, uh, I think we all know we are a diverse community um, we are a welcoming community, especially to the underserved population. Um, and we are a compassionate community. Um, I choose to raise our child here for these reasons, but our compassion is not only being tested here, people, it is being pushed right over the edge. DHS's actions, frankly, are shocking. Um, there's twofold, the non-communication as everyone has talked about and the decision in the first place. So I'm gonna make this short. I echo Dolores's words and thoughts uh, and I'm not really here to offer any suggestions or nuanced solutions. Um, you guys are going to parse that out in your letter. Um, but just really to voice the outrage of the families and the residents that are in the neighborhood and all the people in the short time that have reached out to the community council, the block associations, um, me personally, and the police department on this matter. And I really, really do hope that the committee's voice is very, very powerful on this letter. Thank you. Thanks, Bert. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak? No, I have no Anyone one else? raised. No one? Oh, Ziv again. Ziv? Hi, thanks. Um, so a question to Eric. You said this is temporarily. So what would be the conditions to uplifting, you know, reversing this situation? I mean, Como, de Blasio, they're all talking about how we, you know, we're getting out of the situation. What is the condition to uh, go back to a normality? If Eric is still on the call. Eric Rosenbaum, that's for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I go can ahead. hear you. Okay, okay. So my understanding is that all of these hotel contracts are <clears throat> on a month to month basis for up to six months that the, <clears throat> and this, this is a little bit of inside baseball and I hope I have it right. But um, I think the, the big question is where's the money coming from? Um, and FEMA is covering the cost of the hotel rooms but not the social services. And I believe that um, the FEMA money will end when the national when New York is no longer uh, declared a disaster zone. So if if um, if anyone were to remain in these hotels beyond whatever that point is, the city would the city and the state would have to pick up the bill. Um, but I do. But but no one has no one has actually at least not that I know of issued any criteria for when this hoteling would end. Right. So basically, this can go Eric. on <sighs> yes. forever. Yes. Hold on, Zip. We yeah. One minute, Zip. This, this, this could easily, there's no, we, we don't know where we are as a country. So we're all working through. FEMA, but in fact, home water is extended or it comes back when there's a surge. It may happen again. I think we just need to make it clear that we are not against this practice happening. We are against 
this use of this hotel on this block. So we want to work with you to be able to get folks relocated and not and keep them out of danger, but at a different location, whether that be in Times Square or somewhere else in our community. It doesn't work on this block. And I just want to say again, I really wish, even with the apology, you had just come to us and said, does this spot work? Because we have a willing owner. This owner has a long history with DHS, and it's kind of connected. We would have said, don't do this. It's a mistake for the building and for the block. So let's come back to the committee then. Well, you uh, got you have one more speaker, Joe. Carl have, wants to oh, say oh, something. Sorry. Another hand? I'm sorry. Carl. Oh, Carl. Gotcha. Um, thank you, everybody. And, you know, I, uh, this is Carl Wilson from Speaker Johnson's office, and I just would like to, uh, you know, thank all of the residents from 51st Street who came out. Uh, we all know that we have been working together on a lot of challenging problems on this block, and we were beyond frustrated and, you know, beyond, uh, it, it was uncomprehensible to us that we could receive a phone call at noon uh, about such a drastic move in on this block. And, um, you know, we're really sorry that that happened and that should not have been what happened. And um, I think that uh, when we did learn what happened, we, you know, reached out to Project Renewal right away, who was uh, very eager to work with us and gracious to, you know, come to meeting and meet with, uh, with residents. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, this process was not uh, ideal, to say the least. Uh, this, uh, but we are committed to uh, working with the board to try to, you know, rectify the situation. It's unfortunate that DHS is not on this call to really hear from the community about, uh, about what this decision uh, has, has done to this community. And there is a way to both uh, help the uh, uh, folks that are living in congregate, congregate settings um, during this uh, epidemic and also not uh, be a major disruption to the community. So, you know, I appreciate the board tonight, you know, taking this issue up and trying to uh, listen carefully and let me, uh, you know, make an informed uh, opinion about this. And I just want everyone to know that we are equal partners in this and uh, we want to do what's best uh, for the community um, and what's best for the city. So uh, I just want to let everyone know that we hear them and uh, I appreciate this discussion that I've been able to listen to this evening. So any other speakers or any other elected from the public or elected officials want to say anything? Please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see anybody. No, there's no, no one else. No one else? Okay. No. So then let's have a, uh, this, let's get some key points on this letter. So from our discussion is that, um, again, that we understand is COVID to get people out of temporary, temporarily out of uh, shelters that are congregate for to, to uh, protect against COVID-19, that this location is wrong and we will list every reason why it's wrong. We will give the history of the rest of the things on the block by putting these three, by putting lantern plus win plus this facility, that puts th over 300 uh, homeless units on the block with social service needs. There are 22 permanent residents. We have questions about the owner. We'll just raise that. We're going to ask for a list of hotels. We're going to harp on the notice issue and that we would like to work both with Project Renewal and DHS council member to have this temporary relocation relocated yet again. And we did not hear an objection as long as it could be managed from Project Renewal. Is that, is that, fairly, <laughs> sum, is that fairly sum up the discussion, everybody? Heads, yes? Okay. Joe. So, so Joe. do I have a, a Joe. motion to, sorry, Dolores? Do we want to add suggested locations? Yes. So I, I think we should, we should note the issue of Times Square. That's excellent. I never, never thought of that. I want to bring up the block on West 48th Street, which is full of empty budget hotels. I walk by it every day. Um, and anyone have any other suggestions for hotel locations? So I think, I think it's very important for us to um, not name specific hotels, but to name no, general locations. Yeah, right. 
locations. And I think the reason why is because we cannot know everything that's going on on every individual block. One of the issues right. that we have that early on um, in the pandemic, 48th Street between 10th and 11th have two hotels and folks were not notified on that block. It is a very narrow block. There are folks that right. had been going for cancer uh, um, treatment, et cetera, don't know that why all these people all of a sudden are outside not social distancing. I think it's important to stick to the large areas or on the avenues. And I don't know that we necessarily need to be suggesting areas within our district. I think we need to think about very large areas that can accommodate with social service area available as well as where NYPD can operate easily that does not affect a residential block. That's Dolores, that's the reason I brought up West 40th Street. It's opposite the Port Authority on a totally non-residential block. No, understood. But I just I want, in general, to be very careful about naming right. specific locations since we don't want to go ahead and push a problem that we're having in our neighborhood on a specific block to someone else's block. Got it. Any other thoughts or questions about this? Is there a Oh, Betty, question? Betty? On mute. Um, I have some ambivalence about the block right next to across from the Port Authority because there's so many um, diverse people who are using the sidewalk for their social activities and other activities. So I don't know. I think it compounds the issue of of the neighborhood. I just and, bring up and, a non-residential That's the reason. I, I, I realize that, but then there's a there's a a flip side to the Port Authority have, being very, I'm very familiar with that corner there. Anyway, um, it's unclear to me with these um, projects, moving the congregate facility people to the hotel, if, does the city provide social services, supportive services? Is that part of this package? It is my understanding that the social services from the shelters yeah. are being provided at the temporary location. Is that correct, Paul? Yeah. Yes, Maria, yes, yes. I mean, I don't know if we want to emphasize the importance of the social services to go with this package no matter where it is. I don't know. I, th I think we should note that as a matter of course. Okay. Any further comments about this letter? Is there a motion on the letter? Someone can move it? Motion. Moved by, by Dolores, seconded by Betty. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Anyone present and eligible? Okay, passes. And now we're to a much simpler, but a little more complex problem, which is the Gotham properties and a utility allowance. Maria, can you explain the issue? Uh, basically, I live in a building that's a Gotham property. And this, I was not aware of this. Actually, one of my neighbors uh, pointed out that I should check out my lease. That, and I live in an 80-20, so 20% of the units are subsidized. Um, and I've lived here since 2005. And um, I checked my lease, and the utility credit was not there. And when I emailed the company and said, I think there's an error on my lease, they wrote back to me that was something got um, quote unquote offered. We are no longer offering that. And so I contacted HCC. And what I found out was that at, in every Gotham property in our district, and there's three of them, that tenants in the subsidized units are having the same issue. Um, there are some, there should be some public members currently who are in the building, including someone from HCC um who could probably elaborate more but uh that's why i brought it to this committee to discuss it and see what we are what we can do about it is that elise raising her hand i don't know yes elise leaving yes nelly can you recognize her yes i see elise. hey y'all 
Um, hi, I'm Elise. Um, so I work in the organizing department at Housing Conservation Coordinators. Um, just to preface kind of briefly, I just want to say that um, while HCC has been working on this for a while, I haven't been working on this for very long, so I'm still getting some familiarity with this. So if there are gaps in what I'm saying, um, you know, feel free to ask questions. Um, but basically, so there are two Gotham properties in CB4 and a third that's also in our catchment area. Um, and within all of these properties, we know that this is happening um, to LIHTC tenants. Um, and at this point, you know, several of the, um, of the legislators offices are involved, um, Gottfried and Rosenthal on the assembly and then Corey Johnson's office, um, the city council. So um, it's been partially reinstated um, this utility credit in Gotham West, but not to all of the tenants. Um, and then it has not been reinstated in the other buildings. Um, based on the number of, of units in these buildings, we know that it's probably impacting hundreds of tenants. Um, and this for people who are, you know, paying $700 in rent and having this $70 credit revoked or some something therein, it ends up being an additional 10% of rent. So that's a, that's a big issue. Um, and you know, for us, it's, it's troubling because we subsidize this development under the assumption that we are gaining the public go good of building affordable housing in our communities and keeping our communities, if not fully affordable, more affordable and making sure that we're able to you know, not just make our communities into playgrounds for market rate tenants um, or, you know, playgrounds for, for the wealthy. So um, it's, it's pretty troubling um, and it's, it defeats the purpose of those programs if they're then going to revoke the credits or um, treat LIHTC tenants differently than they treat other tenants. Um, so that, that to us is a real issue. Um, Elise? Yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. I asked Maria, isn't this a lease provision that is part of services? And how could the lease provision be changed unilaterally when it's a normal part of rent? Also, is it, is it part of the original 80-20 uh, agreement? If you can look into that for us, because we want to write an intelligent letter on this. We need to have some more information. Yes. So under um, our, our understanding of it, it is both um, troubling in that it is, it seems to be a violation both of the HFA agreement and of the lease. And you can't just unilaterally change a, a rent stabilized lease. Um, that's okay. completely correct. Yeah, th yeah, that's what we're looking for. So just in general, this is something that we have to get more, is, uh, any, any letter here would be pretty much asking the questions and asking how certain things can happen. So let's go around the room with questions on this, starting with uh, Paul. And I just want to add that what I didn't add earlier. Is oh, go ahead, Maria. I'm sorry. It, there were at least seven neighbors that I spoke to, and it's happening to all of them. And they weren't like we haven't hadn't talked about it at all. So we're all dealing with the same thing. And um, and my concern and the reason I brought it here is because it's not only this building; it's other buildings in our community. And I know that we can do something about it. So I'm sorry, Joe. I cut you off. You were saying something to. <laughs> no. I just want to take to get people's response. So we're going to do a letter on this. Paul? Yeah, first question was just, is this a, uh, is it a dollar amount or, or a percentage amount of the rent? And is it Con Ed, gas and electric, or is it anything else? It, well, it's a dollar amount. I, I, I'm assuming it's done by percentage. I have no idea. Joe would probably know or at least, but it's a dollar it, amount. It, 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 may, it may be a, a credit that goes by apartment size. We'd have to get information yeah, to find out about it. That's what, yeah, that's what I was fishing for. Whether it was across right. the board, same thing for everyone, or the studio must be different than a two bedroom, et cetera. Right. But it's, it's a Con Ed bill, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. That was my only question. Thank you. Um, uh, Leslie? Leslie? Any comments? Yeah, I, I just wondered if uh, Maria has been in contact with the other tenants who are similarly situated. In my building, yes. Okay. Yes, and I connected them to HCC. 
And one of our concerns is the large Gotham West development, which the community board was highly supportive of, has this credit. And there's literally 650 affordable units there that are How affected many? by it. 650? 650. Yeah. Oh. Pete, any, any thoughts? Uh, when did they have, uh, when did they get the notice? Maria? So different people found found it in different ways that utility credit was missing and not everybody was even clear on it. Some people I just said, you know, go check out your lease. Um, and it sounds like it all happened this year for us, at least the people I spoke to that they noticed the change. Okay, okay. So it Has anyone co uh, contacted the... Uh, contact with the Con Edison in regards to that, and no, that comes okay. that's not from Con Edison. It has to do oh, with it's not from yeah, the developer. Okay. But Elise, um, oh, I just lost the question. Shoot, forget it. I'll I'll ask. When I, I just have a quick Sarah, question. Sarah. Can I ask one quick question? Oh yes, yeah. yes, Leslie, go ahead. Is there Finish any up. impact with the change in the uh, COVID uh, regulations for evictions and things that can occur? under this period of time, can that impact this at all as a fight, you know? No, I mean, this is really about that a, a credit that affects many, many tenants in our neighborhood is now gone or is proposed to be gone. It's been restored in some places. We, we want to get some sort of comprehensive response. Gotham has been a very good development partner with the community. This is kind of surprising. Mm -hmm. Sarah's next. I, I don't have any other comments, but yeah, it's very surprising and it needs to be fixed. Okay, Hector. Um, Any comments? Yeah, a question for Maria. You said you had noticed that the the, the credits were missing uh, from your bill. How long ago? Like about a year ago or something? No, or? I just just, just recently. Yeah. So actually, what actually happened is I said, uh, "Can I get a copy of my lease?" They said, "You don't have a lease. My your lease expired in August of 2019." Right. Um, so we're gonna send it to you. Hurry up and sign it and send it back. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Hold up. I need to contact HCC first. <laughs> okay. Got it. Gotcha. Okay. So, I mean, Joe or anybody else, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as leases go, they're supposed to include that in the lease and mention it that either A, at any time, they will remove it or they have to some some kind of notification to the leasees that this I don't know in a rent-stabilized lease if you can change the terms of the lease. I doubt it. Right. Okay. So they was, I assumed they were supposed to sense, they were supposed to send some sort of notice saying that that it was going to change. Correct. I mean, am I incorrect? Oh, I don't know if legally they, I don't know if they can legally change it. That's why we're going to investigate this question. Okay. It's, I got you. It's a service, and you can't just change services without going through a whole process with the rent stabilization with the DHCR. Um, right. So, questions. Yeah. Joe, Carl told me he has an update on this. I just asked oh. Nellie to move him over. Yeah, please. Go ahead, Carl. Wait, quick question. Elise, when did, as far as you know, when did um, tenants start having this issue? In um, other properties last yeah. year. So I'm not sure of the exact timeline of that, but it appears that they're kind of phasing it in different buildings. Carl, do you have, do you have some information for us? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, everybody. So, um, you know, this uh, credit issue had been brought to our attention uh, several months ago and working with our partners at uh, HCC and the Tenant Association within Gotham. We, you know, we approached, uh, we, we approached uh, Gotham and brought this to their attention and uh, it was agreed to that they would reinstate the credit until DHCR had made a determination on whether it was a reduction uh, uh, or service reduction. Um, so while that's making its way through that process, uh, tenants should be able to still apply the uh, credit. So then we need to write to Gotham and request them to do the reinstatement. If you, do, do you have correspondence on that, Carl? Um, I can go back and find that and see about that, Joe. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll have to Anything take to help us sort of get a letter together? Right. Sure. sure. Um, so Dolores, you're next. Yeah, I think that um, unfortunately this type of thing actually happens um, quite often in smaller um, buildings when management may change. I, I would like that we would consider 
um, even though we are specifically addressing Gotham, is that this unfortunately does happen and we'd like to find out how uh, that we can implement some, some type of catchment for these issues uh, when they occur. I, I know within our district, a lot of the um, tenement buildings um, where there's been a lot of movement over the last few years of ownership, one of the concerns is, is that when that happens, the lease uh, illegally is changed because it's a different owner and sometimes it's omitted by accident or sometimes it may be, um, it, it may be uh, deliberate. So one of the things that I'd like for us to also highlight is, is that we would like to figure out a, a way in order to um, monitor, if possible, uh, when these types of, uh, uh, which buildings may happen to have arrangements so that we can try to reduce this, this from happening. Got it. Judith, anything? I agree with what everybody's been saying. It just doesn't seem right that they should be able to get through doing that without anybody noticing it. And I'm glad that everybody's taking action on it. Great. Martin? Martin, any comments? I just want to pull them out. <laughs> I understood that. Patricia? Comments? No comments for me. I agree with what everyone um, has said. So could there be a motion from Patricia summarizing what we came up with? <laughs> yes, I think my nephew and I are down to provide <laughs> this little tech, some little something for us. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, I think that's something, I mean, Maria, we, we discussed this today. I think, um, uh, you know, Gotham, there, there stands to be a, uh, sorry guys, <laughs> there seems to be um, some things that need to be sorted out and addressed. Okay, so, so we write a letter to Gotham, basically with the information from Carl, stating that this credit should be, re be reinstated across the board in Gotham and the other Gotham building until they go through a process with DHCR. All those in favor, raise your hand. Comment, 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 question. Oh, comment, comment from James, sorry. Yeah, and this might be sort of piggybacking off what Dolores said, and I don't know if this is a separate letter, uh, but I'm certainly glad uh, Speaker Johnson's office is represented because there are other abuses that are taking place by landlords, uh, and this is one that um, I reported to HCC, and they actually want to do an intake and maybe a broader initiative related to this. Um, and this is all in light of the fact that so many tenants are facing hardship right now. Um, what, what happened with me is, uh, as, as you all may know, uh, Governor Cuomo uh, passed a COVID-19 um, sort of tenant relief clause that indicated that people could apply their security deposit basically upon request toward one month's rent. It's a stopgap measure. It's not nearly enough, but it is a benefit and it is the right of the tenant. When I inquired to my landlord about this, they claimed incorrectly and possibly fraudulently that they were aware of no governmental authority changing any of the rental terms or, or, or allowing any relief. And, and when I pointed this out to, H, to, to the landlord, they quickly reversed course and, and they immediately within five minutes had a response clearly showing that they were aware of this. Right. And, and if my landlord, who by the way, owns 96 buildings throughout New York City, which is thousands of tenants, uh, if they're doing that, then I have no doubt that there are plenty of other landlords who are trying to mislead their tenants with regard to that, you know, governmental authority. So I, I, I think that is a separate matter. And I, we should probably, we're probably going to be taking up COVID-19 things in, in next month because, because we're getting close to the eviction moratorium, you know, dealing with, dealing with the whole issue with that. It's, it's quite a large issue. But I'd like to focus on this matter right now, if we could um, just that's take fine. a final vote. That's fine. Final if we, vote. That, that's fine if we could do that. But I, I would I would ask that we write a separate letter addressing that because th these issues are timely. Right, and but, but we wouldn't we wouldn't know who to write it to at this point because we need to have right now we have a constituent group with this issue that are the tenants in Gotham buildings. But James, do you have out. any suggestions for what? to put in the letter that impacts me directly. I mean, well, we'll always have great ideas. 
<laughs> well, right, what I'm, but, that's what I'm saying is that what you've been through and what I've been through, I mean, and we're two members of a community board, there are doubtlessly dozens of people who are on the call. Absolutely. So related to the Gotham properties. I'm, I'm saying that it's indicative of a broader issue of landlords taking advantage of, of got tenants. it. That's okay. what I'm I got. I got to close you my, down for now. My, su my I, suggestion. I want to get to this Joe, issue. Joe, yep, my suggestion is yeah. we can add language saying, especially in this time while we are dealing with a crisis of a pandemic and yep. there are obvious concerns about the uh, future of people's ability to pay their rent, landlords may be taking advantage. In this particular case, this is something blah, 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 blah. Thank you, Dolores. Thank you, Dolores. Okay. So all those in favor, raise your hand now, please. Anyone against? Anyone abstaining or not, not present or eligible? Okay, that passes. Next one. Now, next one is an update, care for the homeless. I want to note for members of the public who are on here, we've gotten a lot of information on this. It's been a very difficult project. We know that. And any public to speak must absolutely maintain themselves calmly. We'll have no profanity and no one will be yelling at all. If you are yelling using profanity about this, we will, uh, we will put you on mute. So Maria, give us an update, Sorry. please. I got distracted. I saw a little click. Um, uh, focus. For the We're coming up on a third hour, folks, so focus. Oh, no. Okay, I'm going to make it brief. Care for the homeless, their women's shelter on, hey Natalie, on 52nd between 9th and 10th. They've been there since the fall. Um, I think they were filled to capacity in the winter. We've been having cab meetings since. I don't remember when, um, but Natalie can give updates, but um, as of two or three weeks ago, related because of the COVID relocation, um, they also are no longer at that site. And it's temporarily, temporarily, yeah, temporarily. And it's, I was just going to say, it's unclear how long they'll be at the other site before they return. That was short and sweet, Natalie, your turn. Yeah. <laughs> Almost nine. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, that was that was part of what I was going to say. I also have my two colleagues, Simone Thompson. Okay, perfect. They're there. Just saw them. Um, so as Maria said, you know, we we came before the board last May, I believe, um, you know, to give you information about what the operation was going to look like. Um, there was a little bit of a delay. They were advance notice. Yes. <laughs> Um, there was a little bit of a delay in, in the, getting the actual operation started, but we started in August of 2019. Um, we started with 40 women and then we slowly ramped up in coordination with the Department of Homeless Services. And by December, as you mentioned, we are at full capacity. Um, in terms of what we have on site, we have on site medical and mental health services, and that, those services started in December, and now we're at full capacity for that as well. Um, as you mentioned, Maria, we, we started a, a commute, it's called the Community Advisory Board. Um, we started that in August, about two weeks after we started the operations. Um, and this is a group that we convene of community representatives to help us monitor our impact on the actual community. Um, so at these meetings, we provide updates on the operation, um, including the programs that we're running. Um, and then we also outline any action items um, in coordination with the, with the members that are there with us. Um, at this point, we've hosted five meetings to date. The last one was held virtually on April 2nd. Um, and just some of the issues that have been brought up to our attention and things that we've been working on is um, there was an increase in EMS calls um, to the facility and smoking outside of the facility from our residents. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in terms of what we've done to address some of that, so we answered by monitoring our EMS calls and putting protocols into place um, with our staff to decrease the prevalence of those calls and the numbers have decreased. Um, we outfitted the rooftop. So we have the rooftop that's for the women to use for smoking or just to hang out or to get outside. So we outfitted with benches and planters um, to make it a more inviting space. That was done a couple of months ago. Um, and then we increased, we, we have on-site security. So it, we increased the security around on the block from every hour to every 30 minutes. And they also wear jackets so that you can see that it's a CFH on there. Um, so you can identify them. Um, at this last meeting, so like I said, we have action items that come out of the meeting. At this last meeting, the, what we decided afterwards is that we continue with the increased rounds, um, like I said, from every hour for 30 minutes. Um, we're continue working with the residents and encouraging them to smoke upstairs, not outside of the facility. Um, again, we're still monitoring and documenting all the EMS calls. 
And then we're working with DHS to move peace officers to the facility that's obviously on hold for the time being. Um, and we were told after the pandemic, it's something that we can start working on again, but it is something that's on our, on our list. Um, and then at the last community board meeting, or our last, sorry, our last CAB meeting, um, we had Officer Richardo H. Cruz there. And so, um, you know, we spoke about, you know, working with the local precinct to address any concerns on the block. And that's, that's a working relationship. Um, so, you know, in, in the meantime, you know, we continue to implement these action items and management, myself and, and the, the shelter directors, we remain available to the community to answer any questions or concerns. Um, we have um, some places where community members can either email, they can email us or call us. I can provide that or I can, you know, send it by email, however you'd like. Um, and then as you mentioned, Maria, uh, about a week and a half ago, so to, uh, last weekend, oh, yeah, we, um, we temporarily relocated the residents and our operation to a hotel facility to facilitate so, so, social distancing measures. Um, all of our support services have also been moved on site. Um, we don't know how long that's going to be, um, and much like we talked about earlier, it's, it's, it just depends on how long the pandemic. Natalie, where you've moved to, uh, is that in CD4? It's not. Natalie, is the roof now furnished? I, I didn't quite un understand what's up there. Correct, yeah. So we have three uh, tables with, with benches, and then we put planters just to make it a more inviting space. Our places to sit. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Any questions from the committee about the update on care for the homeless? If no questions from the committee, we'll go to the public. And let's see who's there. I have okay. just one quick question um, about the center. One of the things that's the thread in all of these discussions we've had tonight oh, oh, is, the, Leslie, is the police Leslie, piece I, of this I that she speaks about. I on people from the public. No, I, I plugged in, I was trying to get online, and my question has to do with oh, the I increase see. in police policing in the neighborhood. This is just another one of those situations in which additional police are being required in our neighborhood. It's becoming a police state comment okay let's go look now michael uh, shalero nelly you haven't come in can you hear me yes we can michael hi everyone um i live in 432 west 52nd it is directly across from this facility um and natalie i really appreciate your updates but i'm gonna have to respectfully disagree with all of your data points um, there has been no reduction in police or ambulance presence whatsoever. In fact, it has increased, I would say. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, I've been on this call for three hours listening to the 51st Street concerns, and I genuinely think 52nd Street is a junior 51st Street. These women are screaming, doing drugs. The facility members are providing cigarettes and lighters to these women and the police have been here I would say every hour or two hours and I want to say the week and a half that the women have moved out of this facility the block has completely changed and I'm just really concerned that what's happening on 51st street for the past few years or longer is now what's about to happen on 52nd Street without some action actually being taken. And we've been told that there's gonna be police, peace officers in this facility since, I don't know, six months. So I'm not quite sure we can use the COVID-19 reason as an excuse for that. So the facility is currently closed, correct? The facility is closed, yeah. Yes, so these are the issues that we need to have settled prior to facility reopening. It gives us some room to work together to get these things done. The issue of the staff members handing cigarettes or lighters to the staff, to the tenants, can you please work on that? It's a very simple fix. Take that back and have it dealt with going forward, okay? Now, Absolutely, yeah. That's Thank something you. that we are actively working on with our staff and, and same thing with the women. You know, We have community meetings um, every month, I believe. You can correct me, Simone. Um, and, and also with the case managers, you know, constantly reminding them that they should be using the upstairs. 
And same thing with our staff. Um, there have been a couple of instances and these were the security guards made the decision to do that. Um, but of course, we will continue to work on that. Okay. And, and as I've noted in, in, in meetings before, that the smoking, and if you solve it, you're rid of a lot. They ask you to focus on that. Michael, do you have any other points? Yeah, I just want to put out there that this is not just smoking cigarettes. There is a specific drug dealer on our block that is dating one of the residents who is providing drugs to all of the women in the facility. And this is out in the open. We have photo and video evidence of this. And we have right. called police numerous times and there is no change that has happened. And this is happening for- Resolve problems is able to handle them one at a time. And I hit the smoke first as an issue. Now, as for drug dealing, that's another thing we have to bring, bring to, the, to, to care for the homeless. I'm gonna say a statement though saying, one person is selling drugs to everyone in the overstatement. Probably some people are buying and some people are using. So how are you managing that, Natalie? How are you engaging? What are you doing with that, is, with that matter? So I'll bring Simone into that, but the, the, the one person that you know, we've talked about, especially at the last CAB meeting, they've been transferred. This is the person who was in a relationship with the gentleman who is allegedly um, you mm -hmm. know, selling drugs. So again, he's in a relationship with someone who is in the facility. She's now gone. Um, at the last CAB meeting, we did talk about you know, if there, and that was the correct thing, if there is something that the community sees, that the police need to get involved with that. Um, and so, you know, Officer Guachardo offered to be that resource if necessary. Um, but Simone, I can let you speak to that in terms of, you know, what we're doing with the residents themselves. Go ahead, Simone. So, um, the, the person of concern who's been brought up who had a relationship with a, a person who lives on the block who allegedly is selling drugs, we have moved that person out of the neighborhood. Our resident, the, the gentleman that uh, the allegation is made against is a resident on the block. Um, so that we can't do anything about. He lives there, but we did move the, the woman who was um, allegedly, who was apparently in a relationship with him. Um, and like Natalie said, we'll you know continue um, um, to add activities, maybe on the roof to to. In, but the, the number of residents in in front of the building smoking has decreased. But we will continue to um, do what we can to to keep them um, on the roof in terms of smoking, which I know becomes loitering. So we're we, we're continuing to work. On it. Right. We really want you to know that there needs to be. Zero people smoke in front of the building. It does not help your image or or a lot. Right. We go to Esther next, please. Um, wait, wait, Natalie. Also, can you just share the information you mentioned you were going to share when you get a chance? Okay. Is it the contact information? Yeah. yeah. If you can okay. share that information. Sure. Uh, so the the email address is fifty two Street Info at cfhnyc.org. And then the number is 212-366-4459. And right now it's extension 501. It's usually 502, but since we're in a different uh, facility right now, it's 501. Natalie, okay. can you do that email address one more time again? Sure, it's 52 ST Street, ST, I-N-F-O. 52 Street, At, at, at cfhnyc.com? Dot org. Dot org. Um, I think we lost our next person, Nellie. Is that correct? Uh, no, I have next Esther. Yeah, Esther. Hi, yes. Uh, actually, uh, my name is uh, Kevin Burke. I uh, live with Esther. <laughs> okay, no problem. Sorry. Um, but uh, she's listening in. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I want to say I... Um, I live in 432 West 52nd Street, and I live directly across from uh, the shelter. And um, there, when the shelter was operating, before when I first moved in here, I was under the impression it was a shelter for women with small children. And, it was. And there were no problems, no police, no ambulances, no fire trucks, and I wish that shelter came back. This shelter, um, every day, 
there is when it was open there 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 have been ambulances fire trucks police cars every single day day and night of like 100 percent nighttime 10 p.m there's definitely flashes coming into our window and um it's been great since it's been closed and uh, um there there have been like uh, i now the the new shelter i've been told it's about uh women with mental health issues and my heart goes out to them and i feel this shelter is not giving them the help they need because we have women obviously before it was closed we we've had women just yelling in the street just doing nothing and lunging out at people walking or the or bikers or anything like um, a few weeks ago before it was closed there was this woman just yelling and drinking beer in the middle of the street finally the cops came and they didn't do anything at first because she, technically she was not doing anything wrong she was just yelling and then finally a biker passed by and she lunged at the biker and then and then they didn't really arrest her. Finally, a, a, an ambulance came and this was actually a little bit down the block from the shelter, but the ambulance came to the shelter and then the cops walked her up to the shelter and they got her into the ambulance. This is just one small example of what's been going on on this block and really I feel like whatever sh this shelter has not been, they're mel they they've not been helping the women in this shelter. How, like when this this incident I'm talking about, um, they were talking to the people in the shelter, so it wasn't like it was this one. I don't know for sure. I didn't get involved, but. I'm pretty sure this woman came from the shelter. And uh, like, they were, like, she just needed help. She was really not doing anything wrong. And the shelter wasn't like, there's no play, like, you need to give this woman help. Like, you can't just be letting them house them and then let them on the streets and then do nothing and then, and then you just wait for the cops or the ambulances to come and get them and then help them get them. Like, um, it, it's really sad. Like, I don't know, I, I was watching out my window and like, I, I wish I could help, I don't know what to do, but in order to, to have a proper shelter, you need to have the proper services to help the women. Yeah. So like, like, I, I, I want to say that it's clear this is a very well population. We understand that clearly. And for letting us know, I think this is the, our struggle in engaging with this shelter and this group. And we're not tonight at all. But I'm very much understanding that it is not so simple. I want to move to Ryan Stana, who's next. Yeah, no, uh, can, I, can I just say one more? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. One more point. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I've been listening, I've been on this call since 630 and I really, Leslie and Betty, Betty were saying, what tools do we have to, I want to help, but like, what tools do we have? And Leslie was saying, we all vote. So like, like, who should we vote for to help these people? Instead of writing letters, who should we vote for? Because all the these shelters, including the fifty first one, they're they're getting money from the city, from the state. Who should we vote for to make these places better? I think the problem is we can't tell you who to vote for. We can tell you that we can do our goddamn best to work with every provider to be responsible, transparent, and actually do something. And we're working with this one, and we're not that'll get at all. So we're still on this with you. I need to move to the next speaker, Ryan Stana. Thank you very much, not Esther Zuckerman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Stana, and I'm the president of the board of 432 West 52nd Street. And a lot of our residents were on earlier this evening, but they had to get to bed. So I am speaking on behalf of those residents. And first, I want to say thank you for everything you guys are doing tonight. It's been so informative being on this call and the actions that you're taking. Um, I also want to let everyone know that the two residents that spoke that's in our building at 432 West 52nd previously, I agree with everything they are saying about the shelter across the street. Um, we have had ongoing problems with the shelter from loitering, ongoing emergency vehicles, ongoing screaming, and also negative actions happening with the staff. So not only are the residents of that shelter doing things wrong, they're doing things wrong with the staff outside that our residents are seeing. And we had a meeting with the shelter um, in February of this year. And I promised being the president of this building to send a monthly report to care for the homeless. And I have been doing that since February, doing an operational report of complaints that we are getting at our building or having residents actually come into our building. Um, while things have improved in small steps, um, like Natalie was speaking on the security walks, that was happening for a while. Now it's hardly not happening at all. And we know that because we have residents so sensitive to this subject that they are watching out their windows eight hours a day to make sure something is happening. Um, also, I sent out a mid-month survey in the month of May to all the residents in this building asking if they have felt the shelter has improved or they have felt that it is not. 40% um, feel that the shelter has improved. 60% feel that it has not. And it is my job to change that 60% into a much lower per percentage. Um, after the survey was sent, all the residents moved out, as Natalie was speaking up, due to COVID, which has made our residents even more hyper aware of how much more peaceful it is. And I have received over 40 emails from residents saying, this is so much better, what can we do? And I agree with what Michael is saying, we need to action this because this does sound like the junior version of the lantern. And if we do not action this, our property value is going to drop. And also we need to give this shelter deadlines to be met. Um, also like, like Esther, not Esther Zuckerman was saying, the, the shelter previously um, was amazing and it did not affect our quality of life. And then I, I have to say, about four residents asked me to ask this question to you guys today. I'm not sure exactly what it is meant to be, but I am asked to repeat it as being the president, is there was a police report filed by a resident of our building. Um, and then the director of advocacy and policy made a statement of what she saw that was recorded on security footage at the shelter. And despite requests to see the footage, we were turned down. And when our residents reviewed our own footage that the board approved them to see, it was discovered that that individual did not tell the truth about what was on the video footage in order to misrepresent what happened at the shelter. And our residents want to know what is being done about this. Um, this was now asked to me by five residents of the building just now to ask the statement. Um, that's so specific. Excuse me? Ryan, that to be talked offline with everybody. Okay. Because I think it's way too much for a public discussion, but I think we need to follow up on that. I'm, I'm going to make a note of it, okay? Sure, thank what you. Was the date, what, what was the date of that incident? Um, I do not have the date of that because I was not aware of all of this. Um, but could, could you get that information to, to Maria, please? Yes, I gladly will. Okay. Yeah. Anything okay. else? That, that is it. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Next up is Vikram. I have that information. Can you hear me now? This yes. Is, 
Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, I find it astounding that this shelter is open on a street where just immediately adjacent to that is a primary school and a kindergarten. I mean, it, it, you couldn't think of a more ridiculous place to open this kind of shelter. And the very fact that there are police coming there and there's required security implies that this is not a safe place. And yet, you know, there are two schools next to it. it, it it's ridiculous. But nevertheless, I'd like to voice serious concerns about this place because I'm an owner of a apartment at 432 West 52nd Street, and it definitely devalues our property. We have found it hard to even find people to rent the property now because when they come to see the property, they see this shelter across the road. They see people screaming and walking around. And our previous tenants have told us that they've actually seen drug dealers walking around there. And I'm assuming it's possibly for some of the people staying there. I'd like to also ask the question, and I realize the, quest, the answer could be deflected and not make much use, but I'd still like to ask the question, does mental illness include criminal drug, criminal convicted drug users? A yes or no answer. It, it does, that does not violate privacy to say yes or no. I'd like to know. People who are mentally ill go from working to incarcerated. Mental illness knows no bounds and you cannot determine by looking at somebody with, trust me, I, so it's conceivable I, uh, that part of my work is, is building supports. Sorry, so it's conceivable that in that shelter is a criminal drug user possibly living in there. You, you, you're not saying that's not possible. I, th I, 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 think, I, I think the problem we have here is the phrase criminal drug user. There will be well, people who have misdemeanors for drug for use that are overblown because of the nature of our criminal justice system. You cannot okay, necessarily so say that everybody anywhere is anything. It's too let me rephrase Sorry, my question. Thanks. Is it possible that that shelter contains someone who has been, who has had a criminal conviction for drug use? I will say that the building that you own an apartment in has the same circumstance. There will be someone who owns an apartment who has drug conviction. It happens all the time. We really can't say that the nature okay, of so, the mental illness I mean, means that you are a criminal. Okay, but is is drug uh, is a drug addict considered in the city of New York as somebody with a mental illness? No. Not, it all depends. There, there are people who have dual diagnoses of mental illness and chemical and alcohol abuse. Apparently that contains zero information because it doesn't say yes or no. But. No, no, anyway, please move because on. it's not a yes or no. Can we please Not move on? Yeah. Okay, well, let's go on to the next one. I just wanted to voice my concerns. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Okay, thank you. Next person, Esther Zuckerman again. Uh, yes, Hello? it's uh, actually uh, Kevin, not Esther, Kevin Burke. Not Esther. <laughs> Sorry. But yes, Kevin. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted to um, sorry, reiterate that um, my last example, I have seen other, other things. Another time, like I've seen a well-dressed man just waiting outside the shelter for like, uh, like about 10 minutes or this is during when I'm now, now I'm working from home. So I'm way more aware of what's going on. Um, or like just waiting outside the shelter this well-dressed man, and then someone comes out of, out of this shelter, hands him something. I don't know what it was. It was from my window, but it, it looked like it looked like a, a like a it looked like it was a long a long thing. It looked like a a, a needle in like a plastic thing. So it's just like just another little example and i've never really been trying to look at look at this stuff and since this covid thing it's really since before they they um they closed this place down it was a 
I, I didn't realize how big of a problem it was. And I really feel bad for the people on 51st Street because so they've been dealing with this before, like for years. And, it, and it's not really a COVID problem. Actually, our lives have gotten better because this shelter has closed down because of COVID. I hope COVID lasts forever. Okay, I'm not going to take that one, and we're going to move on. Go to I'm Bauer sorry. Bar. I'm sorry for. Um, I'm sorry. I know. I know it was a joke, but I can't take it. Next, Barrett, go ahead. Nelly, bring Barrett in. Rod. Sorry, just got. Sorry, just got unmuted. So I am on 432 West. Uh, I'm a fairly rare species in the sense that I have two kids, but growing up on the block, we've been here three years. I knew buying in that there is a shelter, but women and children, nothing wrong with that. There are good schools, there are schools right across the street, and there's another school down the block. So I have two kids, and you know, it's now scary. I can't send the kids out, you know, my son takes the dog out for a walk. I can't do that anymore because I have, you know, it, it's, getting, it's getting a little edgy and scary. And at some point, you know, they're walking down the street, and suddenly someone's screaming at them. Um, the inmates, not inmates, the residents of the, of the shelter are actually now down at 52nd and 10th. So, you know, this is not just restricted to what's happening across the street. This is actually spreading a little further down uh, the block. Uh, I'm worried, you know, I have kids and this is, this, is, this is a problem that we have to solve. And this is a recent problem. A year ago, I might not have said this is a problem but there has been a distinct change. You know, I don't want to cross the street right. on the other side of the street. That's something we need to fix. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the next, oh, we have Michael C. Are, are we done, Nelly? Someone dropped out again. Nelly? Michael dropped out. Okay. So um, we have our update. We know this is not fixed at all um, and we are going to return to this again probably next month. And Joe? I think, yes. I'm sorry, Michael. Michael's back. Uh, raised hand to speak from the public. Oh, go ahead. Put him in. Michael, go ahead. Sorry. Hey, sorry about that. Waiting. I went to the bathroom quick. Hey, um, so I'm a resident of 432 as well, and uh, I've lived in Hell's Kitchen for about 10 years. 47th Street, 49th Street. I uh, bought in 432 three years ago. I will say in the last six months, um, it's been part of my language, a shit show. So between, you know, yeah, just the drug use, the vandalism, like people stomping on the flowers that are planted or, you know, people yelling, you know, the flashing lights in my apartment, I, I do face on to the building uh, across the street from me, um, you know, four or five times a day, at least, you know, I, I work long hours, I travel a lot, but I, it's still very noticeable. People come in from out of town and like, what is this? What's that? They don't feel comfortable. I've never not felt comfortable in Hell's Kitchen, though I'm hearing a lot of uh, different reactions tonight. But, uh, you know, the first time I've actually walked on the street sometimes, I'm like, what's going on here with a bunch of people gathering outside? We're just hanging outside the building. And, um, you know, Natalie, I appreciate that you said you, uh, and I, w I haven't been on the whole time, so I apologize if I misinterpret anything, but, you know, we did the, the, the roof of the building, but I've seen, you know, people throw things off that roof, right? So, and again, I'll reiterate, I don't know how this got approved being next to schools, uh, in, a, in a total residential area. It's just, you know, drug use and, and people screaming, yelling, everything else in between. It's, it's, it's not fun to say the least, right? Anyone who lives across from that and sees sirens going into the bedroom windows, you know, four or five times a night, you walk out the door and, you know, the first time I walked outside after about five weeks of being COVID isolated and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a woman yelling with cops and throwing things. Um, you know, it's, it's not fun. It's, it's a little scary, it's nerve wracking. And uh, it's nonstop. So, you know, that's, that's really all I have to say. I don't, it's, I get it's a NIMBY thing, whatever, right? But I mean, it's gotta be controlled somehow. And I don't know how to do that. So I, I'm putting it back to Natalie, you and, and the rest of your team on, on how to do that and make your residents, you know, the neighborhood feel safe and comfortable. Michael, thank you very much for those comments. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else that's left? N Nellie? No, no one else. Okay, so we're going to close this matter and take it up again, most likely in June. And we're going to work with Care for the Homeless and Natalie and all her, the staff there, because we really want to make sure that when the women come back, we're not in the same spot again. So we really appreciate 
that you're trying to engage, but obviously you acknowledge it's got to get better than it is today, than, than it has been, I'm sorry. Absolutely, yes. and, and this is part of, you know, we want to hear these things. So that's why we have the cab and we're speaking to Ryan and in these instances we have, you know, reach out to us, let her know that this is happening. Um, you know, some of these things, these are the first times that I heard it. So it certainly would help to have that ongoing dialogue. And of course, this is something that we're committed to, to really solving. Thank you so much. So I have a question for the committee because we're now at the latest we've been in, I don't know, five years. Anyone have any appetite for the budget? I don't. Hello. No. I think we what we can no do is send out, be, Joe, I think we can like, send out the budget you're, you're information brand. to everybody and then yeah. ask that everybody review it and uh, send back comments so that at least it gets done. Because I yeah. think right now what we're hearing is that we need to make That's sure that. to speak Dolores, up. You Joe, I'm going to I'm going to add one thing to what Dolores was saying, though. If you're going to go that route, the budget committee is meeting yeah. Tuesday night. Oh. Yeah. So it's got to be done before Tuesday, please. Yep, yeah, you can send it to me. You can send it to um, Maria. You're also on the budget uh, task force. Um, yeah. but or, or to Jessica. Everyone. Or to Jessica. Oh, that's right. Ed, that's right. Jessica actually runs it. Um, but what's important is, is that we need to advocate for uh, less cuts in homelessness, housing, et cetera, because clearly what we're hearing tonight from the community, um, we're going to need more and more of these resources. Without the millions of people that come into New York City on a daily basis, right. what is painfully clear is what is left on our streets are those that are damaged that need help and those folks are now not only visible um, but unfortunately they they are desperate without the usual resources they may have to sustain them uh, as they would in a in, in the city that's full so i think that it's important we look at the uh budget we don't have to do it tonight but we do need to have comments is a budget increase in home and health housing is there. What I request is not there. Yeah. This is zero. All the cost use. And uh, no one. So, Joe, are you okay with that? If we actually uh, sign that, maybe Nelly, if we can just send that out to everybody again in email with the attachments. Yes, I can send that out again. Great. The Lord, and, uh, um, everyone froze. What are you talking about sending out? Uh, the budget. budget. The budget. So, Joe, you're frozen. We lose Joe. Maria, you want to close it out? Yes, I would like us to adjourn. Did we decide? I, you froze a little bit before, so I feel like I missed a little bit. But it, it sounds like we're emailing out the budget and we're going to... Um, but and then you guys said something about the budget committee. I'm on the budget committee with Jessica. So what did we decide? We're going to be emailing about this, our suggestions. What did, what did you guys say? Uh, Nelly, oh, yeah. you, you know what to send out, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I will send everything out to the whole committee, and then everyone is to send it to Maria and Jessica. Oh, okay. Or Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, got it. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I think that is it, so we can adjourn. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Motion. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.